Good morning. I'm Warren, a hyperkinetic fellow here is Charlie. <laughs> and uh, we're going to go in just a minute to a uh, question and answer section, that, at least a question section, uh, that will be a little different than last year. We have a panel I can't see very well here uh, over to the right of journalists who will ask questions and alternate with the people uh, in the audience. And we'll go back and forth. Got a little checklist here that we'll use as we go back and forth. Here we are. And we should have a pen here someplace to check things off. But first, even though we'll have the formal meeting later on, uh, I would like to uh, introduce our directors, and if they would stand as I announce them, and then remain standing until the end, and if you'll just hold your applause until the end, or, or even later if you wish, uh, 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 we'll recognize them, we'll, we'll have a meeting later on uh, to elect them, but if you'll stand up, like I say, you can't see very well here with the lights, but uh, there's me and Charlie, we start off, and then Howard Buffett, Susan Decker, Bill Gates, Sandy Gottesman, Charlotte Guyman, Don Keogh, Tom Murphy, Ron Olson, and Walter Scott. Those are the directors of Berkshire Hathaway. Now, we only have one slide, which actually is more than we would usually have. And, uh, but it does, it does tell you something about what happened last year, and it also acts as a commercial for our Nervous Nelly mattress with the famous night depository feature. Uh, last year, and we got that up on the slide, last year we wrote a ticket on December 19th and we sold five million of treasury bills. I hope you can see that. It's, we've got the December 19th circled up there. And those treasury bills came due, or were to come due, on April 29th of this year. So they were going to come due over four months later. And the remarkable thing is, and this tells you something about what an extraordinary year it was, is that we sold those five million of treasury bills, which we're going to pay off at five million on April 29th of 2009. In December of 2008, we sold them for five thousand five million and ninety dollars and seven cents. In other words, if the person who bought those from us and paid us five million and ninety dollars instead had bought the nervous Nelly mattress and had put their money under the mattress, they would have been $90 better off at the end of the year, at the end of four months than, uh, than by buying treasury bills. If the U.S. Treasury had just sold five trillion of these, they could have made an easy $90 million, uh, and Tim, Tim Geithner could have put the money under a nervous Nelly mattress, and we all would have been better off. Negative yields on U.S. Treasury bills uh, a really an extraordinary thing. You got less on less for your money from the U.S. Treasury than you got from uh, sticking it under a mattress. I'm not sure you'll see that again in your lifetime, uh, but it, it's been an, a, a very extraordinary year. Uh, we have with us the journalists. We have Carol Loomis of Fortune. We have Becky Quick of CNBC. And we have Andrew Ross Sorkin of the New York Times. They have received questions from shareholders all over the country. Andrew told me that he received a couple hundred just this morning. And they uh, have selected what they think are, they're all Berkshire Hathaway related questions. We were having a problem uh, in recent annual meetings where Berkshire into the realm of, 
uh, what people's children had done in school recently and that sort of thing. And so we wanted to bring it back a little bit to Berkshire. So they have selected among the best of uh, the, the uh, Berkshire-related questions that they've received. And we will, we will go from, uh, we will start with Carol Loomis, and we will go uh, then to the audience. We have 13 sections, 12 in this room, one in an overflow room, and we, and we have selected the people uh, in each of the audience sections uh, by a uh, raffle system uh, uh, half an hour of an hour ago. And uh, we'll go back and forth, and with that, We'll start it off with Carol. Um, good morning. Um, I come first because uh, Loomis outranks, outranks the others alphabetically. Um, but this uh, gives me a chance to just have a few sentences to tell you that um, about the questions that we received. Uh, we conferred this morning. Uh, Andrew definitely got more than any, either Becky or me. Uh, we got almost 5,000 questions, which I think even will surprise Warren because uh, I don't think he knew that it had run that high. And the, the main thing I wanted to say is that um, an awfully lot of them were very good. Um, and we, we had a real problem uh, trying to uh, get them down to the number that we're probably going to be able to ask. We don't even know what that is for sure. But uh, we want to apologize to anybody who uh, sent us a Berkshire-related question, because we did have to cut out some because they weren't that, and, um, and whose question we didn't get asked. And um, maybe in another year it will work. So my first question, um, uh, Warren and Charlie, Warren particularly, um, <clears throat> Uh, you have referred to derivatives, this is famous, as weapons, financial weapons of mass destruction. In the 1964 movie, Dr. Strangelove, Major T.G. Kong, nicknamed King Kong and played by Slim Pickens, rides a weapon of mass destruction out of the bomb bay of his B-52. As a long-term Berkshire shareholder, I'm feeling a little like Slim today. I understand that despite the dramatic decline in the stock market, there is a good probability we could make money on our derivatives, taking into account the return on our, on our premiums. But given the amount of accounting equity and statutory capital, and I would argue market value, this is the questioner saying this, that these derivatives have destroyed, at least temporarily, do you think these large derivative positions are appropriate for a highly rated insurance company? And if so, do you think you will be adding to these positions? Yeah, I would say this. The questioner, to some extent, answers his own question. That the, uh, I don't know whether he anticipates as strongly as I do that net these positions will make money. But over, over you know, our job is is to make money over time at, at Berkshire Hathaway. It does not impinge on on capital. We have arranged them uh, so that the collateral posting requirements, which are one of the big dangers in the, uh, in the derivatives field, that we have very, very minimal exposure to that. Even on March 31st at a time when the market was down very substantially from when we entered into these transactions, we had posted collateral of a little less than 1% of our total uh, uh, marketable security. So they, they have no, they pose no, they pose problems to the world generally, uh, and that's why I referred to them on a macro basis in the 2002 report as being uh, financial weapons of mass destruction. But I also said in that report that, that we use them in our own business uh, regularly when we think they're mispriced. And, uh, uh, we think our shareholders are intelligent enough that if we explain the transactions as we try to do in the annual report and explain why we think we will make money, there's no guarantee we'll make money, but our expectancy is that we will make money. We think that as long as we explain them that the, that the financial consequences to our shareholders far outweigh any accounting consequences. Uh, we explained uh, in earlier reports that because of a mark-to-market that uh, uh, these things can swing billions of dollars uh, as an accounting liability, but 
For example, in our equity put options, we have received $4.9 billion, roughly, and we hold that money. Uh, originally, the terms of these were 15 to 20 years, so we have the use of $4.9 billion for 15 to 20 years, and then markets have to be lower at that time than they were at the time of inception. So I personally think that the, that the odds are extremely good that on the equity put options we will make money. I think on, on the high yield index uh, credit default swaps we've written, I think that we will probably lose money before figuring the value of the money we've held. Now, I told you a year ago I thought we would make money on those, but we have run into far more bankruptcies in the last year uh, than is normal. We've, in effect, had a financial hurricane. We insure against natural hurricanes, and we insure against a financial hurricane, and we have been in a bit of a financial hurricane. So I would expect those, those contracts before investment income would, would show a loss and perhaps after investment income. The bigger contracts are the equity put contracts, and I think the odds are very high that we make money on those. Now, it would be nice if we were writing them at current prices, but we probably couldn't write them without getting into collateral posting uh, requirements now. So we, we have a very favorable position on those. In fact, in the last week, we modified two equity put contracts, one that had a strike price of 1514. That has been reduced to 994 on the S&P 500. Now, we shortened it up eight years, but it still has it still has about 10 years to run. So uh, merely for re reducing the, reducing the uh, term of it from 18 years to uh, about 10 years, we still have the use of the money for 10 years, we reduced the strike price from 1514 to 994. So I think those are gonna be very advantageous contracts. I think our, our shareholders are intelligent enough to, uh, if they're explained properly, to realize how advantageous they are and we can, we'll continue to hold them and we'll continue to explain them. And they. They have no, no impact on our financial flexibility, and we are far more than an insurance company. I mean, we, we have earnings coming in from many areas. We have lots of cash sitting at the parent company. We have lots of cash in the subsidiaries. We have no significant debt maturities of any kind. So we're ideally suited to hold this sort of instrument. Uh, and Charlie, what, what would you say? Well, I would agree with the questioner that there is some limit to the amount of those things we should do, but I think we stayed well short of the limit. Okay, we'll go to uh, Zone 1. Hi, my name's Scott Slaby. I'm from Denver, Colorado. Um, first off, I'd like to thank Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger for having us out here today. I appreciate you bringing us out here, so thank you very much. And, thank and uh, you. it's thank great you that you ask, answer our questions. I'm a former teacher, or I'm a teacher. Uh, I shouldn't say former. Mm -hmm. Being a former teacher yourself, um, I see a problem with financial literacy with our future generations. And I'm curious what you think future generations should know and if there's anything that needs to be in school curriculums to teach young, younger people financial literacy as we move forward. Yeah. I think there's a problem with financial literacy with our current generation, but the, the, uh, I, there's a, uh, Andy Hayward, who has helped us with the uh, cartoon, has a, uh, will have a, he sold his company last year, but he has a new company, and he, he will have a program coming out that, that works on uh, that question and that, uh, that I play a very small part in. Uh, ABC has a program coming up with a number of, uh, uh, well-known uh, personalities in it that will deal with the question of financial literacy. And it, it, it's, uh, you know, it is a tough, uh, a tough sell in a world of, of credit cards and, and, and uh, you know, a uh, uh, world that depends on, on calculators rather than people uh, sitting down and doing actual arithmetic and all of that to, uh, to teach people. But in the end, I think we make progress over time. I mean, I, I hope our annual reports contribute to that sort of thing. Uh, but you're going to have people doing very foolish things with money. I remember on my honeymoon, I was 21 and my wife was 19 and we drove west. I'd never been to Las Vegas. 
and it was 1952, uh, and we stopped at the Flamingo, and uh, uh, people were better dressed in the casinos then, and there were a bunch of Omaha fellows that actually owned part of the Flamingo at that time, terribly nice to us, but I looked around at that casino, and I saw all kinds of well-dressed people who had traveled thousands of miles to do something very dumb, and I thought, this is a country where you're going to get very rich. <laughs> it, yeah, if, if people are going to get on a plane in New York and fly a couple thousand miles to stand there and do things with a mathematical expectation that's negative on every action they take, that is, it's a world of opportunity. So, I, I uh, you know, I, I recommend that you and, you know, you work with your students. I started teaching at the University of Omaha, you know, when I was 21, and uh, you work with your students to make them literate, and uh, they will have a, uh, a terrific advantage. Charlie? Well, a world where legalized gambling is now conducted by a great many states in the form of lotteries, where people are encouraged to bet against the odds, and uh, a world where we have a vast overuse of high-cost credit card debt. Uh, it needs a lot more financial literacy. I would argue literacy. I think we've been going in the wrong direction. So I don't think you can teach people high finance who can't use a credit card <laughs> intelligently. Yeah, if, if, if you're, if, I talk to students about that. If, you, if you're willing to pay 18 or 21 percent on a credit card, and the credit card companies need it, incidentally, currently, because you have, you have losses running close to 10 percent. So with, with expenses, and they may need that, but there's no way that you're going to financially come out borrowing money at those kind of rates. And, and uh, I wouldn't know how to do it. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's too bad. On the other hand, it's probably, it's probably good for our business. I mean, that uh, one of, you know, we are looking for things that are mispriced and, and uh, the more people think that borrowing money at, on credit cards is intelligent, they probably will not think that doing equity, long-term equity put contracts is intelligent. And <laughs> we'll go our way and they'll go their way. <laughs> Becky? Warren, first of all, we've been asked to pass on a message that the attendance today is 35,000. Good. So. Mm. Now, if, this, they, if they all just spend appropriately, it'll be a big day. <laughs> <laughs> this question comes from James Lewis from Logan, Ohio, who said it was okay to use his name and city. He says, one of the substantial investments of Berkshire is Wells Fargo. The chairman of Wells Fargo supposedly indicated that he did not want to take TARP funds from the federal government. He furthermore recently said that some of the programs of the federal government to reinvigorate the banks were asinine. Mr. Munger, do you agree with the chairman of Wells Fargo, and please explain why you do or do not agree? And Mr. Buffett, do you agree with Mr. Munger? <laughs> When a government is reacting to the biggest financial crisis in 70 years, which threatens important values in the whole world, uh, and the decisions are being made hurriedly and under pressure and with good faith, I think it's unreasonable to expect perfect uh, agreement with all of one's own ideas. I think the government is entitled to be judged more leniently when it's doing the best it can under trouble. Uh, of course there's going to be some reactions that are foolish, and I happen to share one of the troubles of some of the Wells Fargo executives in that I'm pretty blunt. I happen to think that the accounting principle says your earnings go up as your credit is destroyed because if you had any money left, you could buy your own debt back at a discount. I happen to think that's insane accounting. And I think the people who voted it into effect ought to be removed from the board. 
So a man who talks like that has to have some sympathy with the people at, at Wells Fargo. He usually gets to hang him by their thumbs, but he held back this morning. <laughs> the, uh, the government in September, mid-September last year, really did, they were facing a situation that was as close to a total meltdown uh, throughout the financial system as uh, I think you can imagine. It, it, uh, you had a couple hundred billion dollars move out of money market funds in a couple of days. You had the commercial paper market freeze up, which meant that companies all over the country that had nothing to do with the financial world, basically, were going to have trouble meeting payrolls. Uh, we were, we really were looking into the abyss at that time, and a lot of action was taken very promptly. And overall, I commend the actions that were taken. So as Charlie says, to expect perfection out of people that are working 20-hour days and are getting hit from all sides by new information, bad information, that one weekend with with Lehman going, AIG going, Merrill would have gone, in, in my view, unless the B of A had bought it. I mean, it was, when you're getting punched from all sides and you have to make policy and you have to think about congressional reaction and the American people's reaction, you know, you're not going to do everything perfectly. Um, but I think overall they did a very, very good job. Uh, I'm sympathetic. That remark was made by Dick Kabasevich, who came in second last year to Charlie in the plain speaking contest <laughs> around the world. <laughs> and, and it's true that Dick Kabasevich was called on a Sunday at a little afternoon, as I understand it, and told to be in Washington the next day at one or two o'clock without being told what it was about. And, and there were 11 bankers there and, and uh, some officials, and they were told that they were going to take TARP money and they were going to take loans from the government and uh, uh, preferred stock, and that, that uh, they only had an hour or two to sign it, and they didn't get to consult with boards. But that's the nature of an emergency, you know. It, uh, 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 I think, I think you, well, it, you're going to have some decisions that later can be looked back at, and somebody will say, I could have done it a little bit better. But by and large, the authorities, in my view, uh, did a very good job. Uh, and uh, all banks aren't alike by a long shot. And in, in our opinion, Wells Fargo is a... Uh, among the large banks, particularly, it's, it's, a, it's a fabulous bank and has some advantages that the other banks don't have. But at a time like that, you're not, you're, you're not dealing in, in nuances. Incidentally, I, I would recommend to all of you that you go to uh, the Internet and read Jamie Dimon's letter to his shareholders, Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan Chase. It's a fabulous letter. It, it talks about uh, a point that Charlie made there. But it... Jamie did a great job of, uh, of writing about what caused this and, and uh, what might be done, done in the future. It's, it's, uh, it's as good a shareholder's letter as I've ever seen. So by all means, uh, look it up. It's long, but it's worth reading. Okay, we'll go to area two. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger. My name is Rick Franklin. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. I'd like to follow up on the microphone one's question on financial literacy and my own question from two years ago on your discount rate. Um, but before I do that, I, I hope you'll indulge me. Tor Stoll's wife, Rosemary Coons, if you could come to section 222, I found your husband. Uh, you can come to my microphone, too, if that's easier. Uh, you get a little of everything here. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is free cash flow. Sell-side analysts like to do a 10-year discounted cash flow analysis with the terminal value. Even some of the books written about your style, uh, the Warren Buffett way, Buffettology, imply that you go through that exercise. But I know you're famous for not using computers or calculators. I'm wondering if those type of exercises fall into the too hard uh, file and you, and you just do a simple...
free cash flow, normalized free cash flow over a discount rate. And if you care to augment the answer with your numerical analysis of Coke, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> well, the answer is that investing, all investing is, is laying out cash now to get more cash back at a later date. Now, the question is, how much do you get back? How sure are you of getting it? When do you get it? It goes back to Aesop's fables, you know. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Now, that was said by Aesop in 600 B.C. Now, and he was a very smart man. He didn't know it was 600 B.C., but, I mean, he couldn't know everything. The, uh, <laughs> but that, that's what's being taught in, in the finance. You, you get a Ph.D. now, and, and, and you, you do it more complicated, and you don't say a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush because you... You can't really impress the laity with that sort of thing. But the real question is, how many birds are in the bush? You know you're laying out a bird today, the dollar. And then how many birds are in the bush? How sure are you in the bush? How many birds are in other bushes? What's the discount rate? In other words, if, it, if, if interest rates are 20%, you've got to get those two birds faster than if interest rates are 5% and so on. Uh, that's what we do. I mean, we are looking at putting out cash now to get back more cash later on. Uh, you mentioned that I don't use a computer or a calculator. If you need to use a computer or a calculator to make the calculation, uh, you shouldn't buy it. I mean, it should be so obvious that you don't have to carry it out to tenths of a percent or hundredths of a percent. It should scream at you. So you know, if, if, if you really need a calculator to figure out that it's, the discount rate is 9.6 percent instead of 9.8 percent, forget about the whole exercise. Just go on to something that shouts at you. and, and uh, Essentially, we look at every business that way, but we, it, you're right, we do not make, we do not sit down with spreadsheets and do all that sort of thing. We just, we just see something that obviously is better than anything else around that we understand, and, uh, and then we act. And uh, Charlie, you want to add to that? Well, I'd go further. I'd say some of the worst business decisions I've ever seen are those that have done with a lot of formal projections and discounts back. Uh, Shell Oil Company did that when they bought the Bell Ridge Oil Company, and they had all these engineers make all these elaborate figures. And the trouble with that is you get to believe the figures, and, uh, and it, it it seems that the higher mathematics, with more false precision, should help you, but it it doesn't. It it, it the effects averaged out are negative when you try and. Uh, formalize it to the degree you're talking about it. They do that in business schools because, well, I've got to do something. There's a lot of truth to that. I mean, if you stand up in front of a class and you say a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, you know, you're not going to get tenure. <laughs> so it's very important if you're in the priesthood to look at least like you know a whole lot more than the people you're preaching to. And if you, if you come down and just, if, if you're a priest and you just hand down the Ten Commandments and you say, this is it, and we'll all go home, you know, you, you, it, it just isn't the way to progress in the world. So uh, the false precision that goes into saying this is a two standard deviation event or this is a three standard deviation event and therefore we can afford to take this much risk and all that, it's totally crazy. I mean, you saw it with long-term capital management in 1998. You've seen it time and time and time again. And it only happens to people with high IQs. You know, those of you who are, have 120 IQs are all safe. <laughs> but if you have a very high IQ and you've learned all this stuff, you know, you feel you have to use it. And, and uh, the markets are not that way. The markets of mid-September last year, when people who ran huge institutions were wondering how they were going to get funding the next week. You know, that doesn't appear on a, you can't calculate the standard deviation that, that that arises at. It's going to arise much more often than people think in markets that are made by people that get scared and get greedy. Uh, and they don't observe the laws of flipping coins at, uh, in terms of the distribution of results. And it's, it's a terrible mistake to think that mathematics uh, will take you a long place in investing. You have to understand certain aspects of mathematics, but you don't have to understand higher mathematics. And higher mathematics may actually be dangerous, and it will lead you down to in, down pathways 
are better left untrod. Okay. Andrew, one of those 200 questions from this morning, or what? <laughs> this one's not from this morning, but um, it relates to Moody's, and we probably received about 300 questions at least on this topic. Uh, this question, which is representative of many, uh, comes from Aaron Goldsmeiser, and the question is the following. Given the role of rating agencies in the current economic crisis, their conflict of interests, their reliance on, quote, flawed history-based models, as you describe in this year's letter to shareholders, and the likelihood that a loss of credibility and or regulatory reforms could force drastic changes in their business models or earning streams, why do you retain such a large holding in Moody's? And more important, why didn't you use your stake to try to do something to prevent conflicts of interest and reliance on these flawed history-based models? Yeah, I don't, I don't think the conflict of interest question was the, was the biggest, by uh, anywhere close to the major cause of, of the shortcomings of the rating agencies in, in uh, foreseeing what would happen with CDOs and, and CMBSs and all sorts of instruments like that. Basically, five years ago, virtually everybody in the country had this model in their mind, uh, formal or otherwise, that uh, house prices could not fall significantly. They were wrong. Congress was wrong. Uh, bankers were wrong. People who bought the instruments were wrong. Lenders, uh, the borrowers were wrong. You know, but people thought that if they were going to buy a house next year, they better buy it this year because it was going to be selling for more money the following year. And people who lent the money said it doesn't make any difference if they're lying on their application or they don't have the income because houses go up and if we have to foreclose, we won't lose that much money. And besides, they can probably refinance next year and pay. So there was a almost total belief, and there was always a few people that disagreed, but there was almost a total belief throughout the country that uh, house prices would certainly not fall significantly and that they would probably keep rising. And, and the people that the rating agencies, one way or another, built that into their system. And I, don't, I, I really don't think it was primarily the payment system that created the problem. I think they just didn't understand uh, uh, the, the various possibilities of what could happen in a market uh, or in a, bu in a bubble, really, <clears throat> where people leveraged up enormously on the biggest asset that most Americans possess, their house. And so you had a $20 trillion asset class in a $50 trillion of, of total assets of American families, a $50 trillion that got leveraged up very high. And then once it started melting down, it had, it had self-reinforcing aspects on the downside. So I say that they made a major mistake uh, in terms of analyzing the instruments, but they made a mistake that a great, great, great many people made and that probably if they had taken a different view of residential mortgages four or five years ago, they would have been answering to, to uh, congressional committees who would be saying, how can you be so un-American as to deny all these people the right to buy houses simply because you won't rate these securities higher. So I, they, made, they made a huge mistake, but the American people made a huge mistake. Congress made a huge mistake. Congress presided over the two largest uh, mortgage companies, and they were their creatures, and they were supervised by them, and, you know, and they're both in conservatorship now. So I don't think they were unique in their inability to spot what was coming. In terms of us influencing their behavior, uh, I don't think I've ever made a call uh, uh, to Moody's, but it's also true that I haven't made it to, uh, or made, maybe made one or two to other companies in which we're involved. I mean, we don't, we don't tell, you know, the Burlington Northern what safety procedures to put in. We don't tell American Express who to cut off on credit cards and, you know, what they're, who they should lend to and who they shouldn't. Uh, uh, we are, when, when we own stock, uh, uh, we are not there to try and change people. Our luck in changing them is very low anyway. In fact, Charlie and I have been on boards of directors where we're the largest shareholders, and we've had very little luck in, the, in changing behavior. So we think that if you buy stock in a company, uh, you know, you better not count on the fact that you're going to change uh, their course of action. And, and in terms of selling the stock, uh, the odds are that the rating agency business is probably still a, a good business. It, it is subject to attack, uh, and who knows where that leads, and who knows what Congress does about it. But 
it, uh, it's a business with very few people in it. It's a business that affects a large uh, segment of the economy. I mean, the, the capital markets are huge. I think there will probably be rating agencies in the future, and I think that uh, it's a business that doesn't require capital. So it, it has the fundamentals of a pretty good business. Uh, uh, it won't be doing the volume uh, in the next, probably for a long time, in certain areas of the capital markets, but capital markets are going to grow over time. We have said in this meeting in the past many times that Charlie and I don't pay any attention to ratings. I mean, we don't, we don't believe in outsourcing investment decisions. So we, if we buy a bond, the rating is immaterial to us unless, except to the extent that the, if we think that it's rated more poorly than it should, it may help us buy it at an attractive price. But we do not think that the people at Moody's or Standard & Poor's or Fitch or any place else uh, should be telling us uh, uh, the credit rating of, uh, of a company. We figure that out for ourselves, and, and, some, and sometimes we disagree with the market in a major way, and, and uh, we made some money that way. Charlie? Yeah, I think the rating agencies being good at doing mathematical calculations eagerly sought stupid assumptions that enabled them to do clever mathematics. It's, it's an example of being too smart for your own good. There's an old saying, to a man with a hammer, every problem looks pretty much like a nail. And that's what happened in the rating agencies. Yeah, the, inter the interesting thing is about a lot of those triple A's is the people that created them ended up owning a lot of them. So they, they believed their own baloney themselves. Every, it was, it, the belief was enormous. So you've had these people stirring up the Kool-Aid and then they drank it themselves and, and they, um, you know, they, they paid a big penalty for it. But I don't think it was, I think it was, I think it was stupidity and the fact that everybody else was doing it. I, I send out a letter to our managers only every couple of years, but the one, the one, reason you can't give at Berkshire, as far as I'm concerned, for any action is that everybody else is doing it, you know, and it just, it, if that's the best you can come up with, you know, something's wrong. And so, but that happens in security markets all the time. And of course, it's when Charlie and I were at Solomon or someplace like that, it's very difficult to tell a huge organization that you shouldn't be doing something that the people, well-regarded competitors, are doing, and and particularly when there's a lot of money in it. So it's very hard to start stop these things once you get sort of a sort of a uh, an industry acceptance uh, of behavior. And uh, you know, we were very unsuccessful, Charlie and I, at, at, at a Solomon, and saying, "Well, we just don't want to do this sort of thing." We couldn't even get them initially when we got in there at first. Uh, they were doing business with Mark Rich, and we said, "Let's stop doing business with Mark Rich." You know, that's like saying in the 30s, let's stop doing business with Al Capone or something. And uh, they said, but it's good business. If he doesn't do it with us, he'll do it with somebody else. And, and they felt that way. And I, I think we won that one, but it wasn't easy. Do you remember that, Charlie? I certainly do. Yeah. Okay, we'll go to area three. <laughs> Okay, zone three, are we on? I'm Lori Gould from Berkeley, California. Where do you see the residential real estate market headed nationally, particularly in California, over the next year or two? Well, we don't, we don't know what real estate is going to do. We didn't know what it was going to do a few years ago. We thought it was getting kind of dangerous in certain ways. But, but it's very... It's very hard to tell. I would say this, from what, we're, what I'm seeing, and I do see a lot of data, there's, and California incidentally is a very big, I mean, there are many markets within California. Stockton is going to be different than San Francisco and so on. But in the last few months, you, <clears throat> you've seen a real pickup <clears throat> in activity, <clears throat> although at much lower prices, but you've seen, I, I think you've seen something in the medium to lower price houses, and medium means a different thing in California than it does in Nebraska, but, but you've seen in maybe $750,000 and under houses, you've seen a real pickup 
in activity, many more bidders. You haven't seen you haven't seen a bounce back in price. Prices are down significantly and varies by the area. But it it looks as if you, know, you had a foreclosure moratorium for a while, and so you you get into uh, distortions because of that. But what it looks like looking at our real estate brokerage data, and we have the largest real estate brokerage firm in Southern California in Orange County, Los Angeles County, and San Diego County, and Prudential of California, that's owned by Mid America. We, we, we see uh, something close, I would say, to stability at these much reduced prices in the medium to lower group. If you got a $5 million house or $3 million house, uh, that still looks like a very uh, erratic, it, 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 it's a market in which there still isn't a lot of activity. But in the lower levels, uh, there's plenty of activity now. Houses are moving. Interest rates, of course, are down, so it's much easier to uh, make the payments. The mortgages being put on the books every day in California are much better than you know the mix that you had a few years earlier. So the, it's improving. And uh, uh, I don't know what it'll do next month or three months from now. And the, the housing situation is pretty much this way. You can look at it this way. We create about a million three hundred thousand or so households a year. It bounces around some, but and it it tends to in a recession it tends to be fewer because uh, people postpone uh, matrimony and so on uh, to some extent. Uh, but if there's a million three hundred thousand households created in a year, and you create two million housing starts annually, you are going to run into trouble. And that's what we did. We just created more houses than the, the demand was, the fundamental demand was going to absorb. So we created an excess of houses. How much excess is there now? Perhaps a million and a half units. We were building two million units a year. That's down to 500,000 units a year. Now, if you create 500,000 units a year and you have a million 300,000 households created, you are going to absorb the excess supply. It will be very uneven around the country. South Florida is gonna to be tough for a long, long time. So it isn't like you can move a house from one place to another if there's demand in one place and not another. But we are eating up an excess inventory now. And we're probably eating it up at the rate of seven or 800,000 units a year. And if we have a million and a half excess, that takes a couple of years. Uh, there's no getting away from it. You have three choices. You could blow up a million and a half houses, you know, and uh, if they do that, I hope they blow up yours and not mine, but that's it. Uh, we could get rid of it. We could, we could try to create more households. We could have 14-year-olds start getting married and having kids. And, uh, or we can produce less than, than the natural demand increase. And that's what we're doing now. And we're going to eat up the inventory. And you can't do it in a day and you can't do it in a week. But, you, but it will get done. And when it gets done, then you will have a stabilization uh, in prices. And, and then you will create the demand for more housing starts. I mean, then you can go back up to a million and a quarter, and then our insulation business and our carpet business and our brick business will all get better. Uh, exactly when that happens, nobody knows, but it will happen. Charlie? Well, I think in a place like Omaha, which never had a really crazy boom in terms of housing prices, with interest rates so low if you've got good credit, that if I were a young person wanting a house in Omaha, I would buy it tomorrow. We own the largest real estate brokerage firm in Omaha, so Charlie will be called. <laughs> if he qualifies, uh, we will give him a mortgage application. It is. It is true that four and a half million houses will change hands. There's about 80 million houses in the country. 25 million of those do not have a mortgage. About a third of the houses in, in the country do not have a mortgage. You've got about 55 million or a little less that have a mortgage. And five or six million of those are in trouble one way or another. But we're selling four and a half million houses every day. And by and large, they're going into stronger hands. The mortgages are more affordable. The down payments are higher. We're, the situation is getting corrected but it wasn't created in a day or a week or a month. It's not going to get solved in a day or a week or a month. We are on the road to solution. Okay, Carol. Um, uh, 
Perhaps I should have said one other thing at the beginning. Those of you who read the annual report carefully know that uh, Charlie and Warren uh, were to be given no clue as to what any of the three of us were going to ask, so don't think that they have uh, gotten a little list. Uh, they've seen nothing. Um, this question, uh, uh, I got many versions of this question. This one happened to come from Jonathan Brandt of uh, New York City. It concerns the four investment managers you have said are in the wings as possible successors to you. Can you please tell us, without naming names, but preferably in both quantitative and qualitative terms, how each of the four did in 2008 with the money they are managing, they were managing for their clients. You said you hoped to pick people who would be able to anticipate things that had never occurred before. While the world has seen credit crises before, there were a lot of things that happened in 2008, especially in the last few months of the year, that few were predicting and that you yourself have described as almost unprecedented. How would you rate the way that these managers, these four managers, did in managing against these low probability risks? Are all four still on the list? Well, the answer is all four still on the list. And uh, let me just make one point first, too, because it got misreported a little bit. Uh, we have three candidates for the CEO position, and this is always a major subject of discussion at our, our um, director's meetings. All of them are internal candidates. You should, you should know that. That, that. That's been said before, but it got misreported here once or twice. Uh, and it got confused, I think, because of the four possibilities for the investment job. And you could have all four come to work for us in that case. We won't have three CEOs or two CEOs, but we'll have, we might have multiple investment managers after I'm not around, or, or we might just have one. That would be up to the board at that time. They are both inside and outside the organization, and, and, and we don't preclude anything in terms of where they come from. So we, we could have a whole big list from outside the organization. That will not be true about the CEO position. The person that follows me will come from within uh, Berkshire Hathaway. The four, I don't have precise figures from them, although I've got a fair amount of information on someone. I would say they did no better than match the S&P last year, which was minus 37 after adding back dividends. So I would say that in terms of, of 2008 by itself, uh, uh, you would not say that they, uh, they covered themselves with glory, but I didn't cover myself with glory either, so I'm very tolerant of that in 2008. <laughs> the, uh, Charlie, you, you know, some of the records pretty well, uh, wouldn't you say that's true? Yeah, what's interesting to me is that practically every investment manager that I know of in America and regard as intelligent and disciplined and, and with an unusual record of past success, they all got creamed last year. The group. I don't hear a lot of laughter about that. I think you're hitting a nerve out there, Charlie. The, um, the, the four have a better than average record over time. If you'd asked me at the start of the year, if you'd said there's going to be a minus 37% year, will this group do better than average? I would have said yes, but I think I would have been wrong. And, and uh, like I said, I, didn't, I haven't gotten audit returns from every one of them, but I would say I would be wrong. I would say they... Uh, I would say that their record over 10 years has been, in each case, has been anywhere from modestly to significantly better than average, and I'd be willing to bet that would be the case over the next 10 years. But, but certainly uh, last year, you know, a lot of things, there were a lot of things that didn't work, and uh, our group was not exempt from them. I have not changed the list. Um, at, um, that doesn't mean that we're always looking in with the idea of finding more people to add to it. And as opposed to the CEO job, you know, if I drop dead tonight, the board needs to put somebody in as a CEO tomorrow morning, and, they'll, and they will do so, and they know who it is, and, and they feel very good about it. Uh, not too good, I hope, but, the, but, uh, <laughs> but on, the, on the investment officers, one or more, and it could easily be more, 
they don't need to do something the next day or the next week. I mean, the portfolio isn't, everything doesn't stop because of that. So they can, that can be a somewhat more leisurely decision they'll have. And it will be made uh, in an important way in, 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 uh, uh, in, in consultation and agreement with the new CEO. So that, that is something that you shouldn't expect the next day to hear an announcement on the investment managers, but you should expect to hear, you know, within a month or something like that. I don't think we would uh, want a manager who thought he could just go to cash based on macroeconomic notions and then hop back in when it was uh, no longer advantageous to be in cash. Since we can't do that ourselves. Yeah, we think it's impossible if we can't do it ourselves. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so we're not looking for a type who, who, who went to cash totally. No, that would, in fact, we would leave out anybody that did that. Yeah, we would exclude them. Yeah. That, that, They're not dumb enough for us. <laughs> Okay, let's go to zone four. Hi, Mr. Mr. Buffett, Mr. Munger. My name is Vern Cushenberry. I'm from Overland Park, Kansas. Uh, I wonder if you might share your thoughts on the likelihood of a nationalized health care system, what that might look like, and the effects on your portfolio. Well, I'm going to let Charlie answer that one since I don't know how to. Yeah. <laughs> Personally, I think something more like Europe will come to the United States in due course. And I think it'll be supplemented by a private system, which is the equivalent of private school competition for public education. And although I'm a Republican, I'm not horrified by that probable development. Personally, I wish they'd put it off for a year while we solve the economic problems. And I would say that in terms of its impact on Berkshire, you know, we have, we have a broad cross-section of companies. We have 246,000 people working for us. That we, we will adjust like American business generally will adjust uh, to any developments along that line. That, uh, it, it, it won't pose special problems for us. It won't offer us special opportunities. We'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll see what national, the national sentiment is as expressed through Congress, and, and uh, we'll behave accordingly. Becky? Uh, this is a question that follows up on the succession question. This one is, uh, in particular, though, addressed to the three candidates for CEO. It comes from Irving Fenster, who writes, Running Berkshire is very complex and complicated. Give us some insight for your reluctance to bring in your replacement to give him the benefit of your training instead of his having to tackle the myriad of problems of the transition on his own. The benefits for Berkshire, your replacement, and you are so compelling, your reluctance is puzzling. Having him on board may relieve some of the stress on you and help add many, many more years of good health for you. Uh, Irving is a friend of mine in Oklahoma went in my partnership 40 years ago, Irving and Irene, and he's been writing me on this for 30 or 40 years, and he's had, <laughs> he's had no luck with me, so he decided to write Becky, apparently. Uh, <laughs> if, if we had a good way to inject somebody into some role that, was, that was, uh, would make them a better CEO of Berkshire, uh, we, would, we, would, we would try it. But the truth is that the candidates we have are running businesses, they're making capital allocation decisions, they're, they're doing things every day of an operating nature, that, and these are major businesses. Uh, and to sit around headquarters while I'm sitting in there reading and on the phone and, you know, who knows what else, the, the, it, 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 there just isn't, there wouldn't be anything to do. I mean, we could, we could meet every hour, you know, I, mean, I could... I could say, here's what I'm thinking about now. What do you think about this? And uh, it, it'd, be it'd be a waste of talent. Uh, it'd be ridiculous. And Irving has this notion that somehow, you know, that they would be absorbing all these things that I'm doing. I just, I just throw the Wall Street Journal to them all over after I'm re done reading, and I throw them the New York Times, and I throw them the FT. And, and, and 
uh, th these are people that know how to run big businesses. They run businesses that make many, many, many millions or even billions of dollars. They, so uh, they, are, they are ready for the job right now. Uh, they're, they're, we wouldn't be, I wouldn't be happy unless we have, they, they are 100% ready. They know how to allocate capital. The biggest job they'll have is the fact that they, they will have to develop relationships with potential sellers of businesses, uh, with the world generally, with you, the shareholders, uh, with the other managers. They, that, that takes some time, not an extraordinary time, but that, you know, they will have to become acquainted with people, but, but uh, different constituencies. But the, there's, uh, you know, that, that is nothing that really does to be hastened along. It's nothing terribly important. I mean, they know how to run businesses and they, they would do many things much better than I would. The, the biggest, probably the biggest challenge, uh, because we have all of those talented managers that you saw uh, during the movie, and those people have different styles, and they have different, they have different needs to some degree. They have different ways of operating. They're all successes, but you know, some of them, some of them bat left-handed, some of them bat right-handed, some of them stand deep in the box. You know, some of them crowd the plate. I mean, they all, they all have a little bit of variation, but they all hit terrifically. And for the CEO of Berkshire, it, it does require uh, some knowledge of the individual personalities and which ones like to run by themselves totally and which ones like to check in occasionally and all that. But that is, that is no reason to take a talent that's now running a business very successfully and building value and uh, have him sit in an office next to me and, and uh, have us uh, chew over the day's events. I mean, Charlie and I worked together now for for decades, and and I've learned a lot from Charlie, but I haven't done it by, you know, ha having him sit next door and and have hourly meetings or anything of the sort. What do you think, Charlie? Well, I think averaged out, you're more likely to be qualified to be a CEO by running a subsidiary with an enormous amount of discretion than you are to be around headquarters watching somebody else do it his way. Uh, so, a lot of the models that have worked well in the world, like Johnson & Johnson, uh, the, uh, the, are quite Berkshire-like in that they're decentralized and they let these people pop up from the subsidiaries. They don't try and just create CEOs in a hothouse in headquarters. We have an unusual situation at Berkshire that most of the people at the top, virtually all of them, are doing what they want to do. I mean, they, they like running their businesses. That's what they came in expecting to do, and that's what they're doing, and we're letting them do it the way they like to do it. And so we don't have 50 people that are all think they're on some pyramid to get to the top. And Irving would like me to name, uh, he's talked to me about it, he, he would like me to name who it would be, but that could change in the future. It could create, it could create some possible, uh, well, you saw it at General Electric. I mean, when, when Jeff Immel got appointed from among three, the other two left. And uh, I don't really see any advantage in, in, uh, in having some crown prince around, but, uh, but Irving will keep riding me. I can promise you that. <laughs> okay, zone five. Hi, Warren. That's a little loud, sorry. Hi, my name is Sarah and I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. Um, I'd like to know if you could explain your strategies, namely value investings, in regards to cultivating the next generation of investors. How will you teach this young group? Well, I had 49, uh, mostly universities, few colleges, uh, that came to Omaha this year. We do them in clumps of six, and then the last one we had an added university. So we had eight sessions, full day sessions. And they asked me what, sometimes they asked me uh, uh, what I'd do if I was running a business school teaching investments. And I tell them I'd only have two courses. One would be how to value a business, and the second would be how to think about, about markets. And uh, there wouldn't be anything about modern portfolio theory or beta or efficient markets or anything like that. We'd get rid of that in the first 10 minutes. The, uh, but if you know how to value a business, and you don't have to know how to value all businesses, on the New York Stock Exchange, I don't know, there's four or 5,000 probably businesses and 
whole lot more on NASDAQ. Uh, you don't have to be right on 4,000 or 5,000. You don't have to be right on 400. You don't have to be right on 40. You just have to stay within the circle of competence, the things that you can understand, and look for things that are selling for less than they're worth of the ones you can value. And uh, you can start out with a fairly small circle of competence and learn more about businesses as you go along, but you'll learn that there are, there are a whole bunch of them that simply don't lend themselves to valuations, and you forget about those. Uh, and I think if accounting helps you in that, you need to understand accounting to know the language of business, but accounting also has enormous limitations, and you have to, you have to learn enough to know what accounting is meaningful and when you have to uh, ignore certain uh, aspects of accounting. You have to understand when competitive advantages are durable and when they're fleeting. I mean, you have to learn the difference between a hula hoop company, you know, and Coca-Cola. Uh, but that isn't too hard to do. And then you have to know how to think about uh, market fluctuations and, and really learn that the market is there to serve you rather than to instruct you. And to a great extent, that is not a matter of IQ. Uh, if, you have, if you're in the investment business and you have an IQ of 150, sell 30 points to somebody else because you don't need it. I mean, it, <laughs> you, you, need to be, you need to be reasonably intelligent, uh, but you, you do not need to be a genius you know, at, at all. Uh, in fact, it can hurt. Uh, so, but you do have to have an emotional stability. Uh, you have to have sort of an inner peace about your decisions uh, because it is a game where you get subjected to minute-by-minute minute stimuli where people are offering opinions all the time. You have to be able to think for yourself. And uh, I don't know whether the, how, I don't know how much of that's innate and how much can be taught, but uh, if you have that quality, uh, you'll do very well in investing if you spend some time at it learn something about valuing businesses. Uh, uh, it's not a complicated game. As I say, met, said many times, it's simple but not easy. It, it is not a complicated game. You don't have to understand higher math. You don't, you know, you, you don't have to understand law. There's all kinds of things that you, you don't have to be good at. There's all kinds of jobs in this world that are much tougher. But you do have to have sort of an emotional stability that will take you through almost anything. And uh, and then you'll make good you'll, you'll make good investment decisions over time, Charlie. Yeah, you do have the basic problem that exactly half of the future investors of the world are going to be in the bottom fifty percent. In other words, you're always going to have more skill at the top than you have at the bottom, and you're never going to be able to homogenize uh, the investment exercise, uh, expertise of the world. There is so much that's false and nutty in modern investment practice and in modern investment banking and in modern academia in the business schools, even the economics departments, that if you just reduce the nonsense uh, that's all I think you should reasonably hope for. Beyond a certain basic level of skill, wouldn't you say your emotional makeup is more important than, the, than some super high degree of skill? <laughs> uh, absolutely. And, and if, you, if you think your talent, if you think your IQ is 160 and it's 150, you're a disaster. <laughs> you know? Much better a guy with 130 that's operating well within himself. I, I, I get to see the students that come by. I loved a fellow from the University of Chicago, uh, one of the students, and the, the first question that was asked to me is, what are we learning that's most wrong? I mean, that, yeah. that's the kind of, I wish they'd asked that sort of thing of the panel here. That, How do you a, handle that in <laughs> one session? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was holy writ 25 years ago. Efficient market theory, you know, that the, the, I never understood how you could even teach it. I mean, if you walked in in the first five minutes, you said to the students, everything is priced properly. I mean, how do you kill the rest of the hour? But it, they did it. 
and they got and they got PhDs for doing it well, you know. And the, the and the more Greek symbols they could work into their, uh, you know, their writings, the you know, the more they were revered. It, it's astounding to me, and I, it may have even given me a jaundiced view of academia generally, is the degree to which ideas that are nutty take hold and get propagated. And then I read a quote the other day that may have partially explained it. Max Planck was talking, the famous physicist, that Max Planck was talking about the resistance of the human mind, even the bright human mind, to new ideas, and particularly to ones that had been developed carefully over many years and and were were blessed by by others of stature and so on. And he said, science advances one funeral at a time. And I think there's a lot of truth to that, and it's certainly been true in the uh, world of finance. <laughs> okay, Andrew. Okay, uh, we have a succession question. However, this one has a twist uh, coming from Ben Knoll. Uh, you famously said, quote, you should invest in businesses that a fool can run because someday a fool will. Given your reinsurance company's capacity and inclination for big financial bets, can you provide us more reassurance about the risk once Ajit is gone? Do you have a succession plan for him? Ben says, the Titanic-like ending at AIG, once Greenberg was gone, has me spooked. Yeah, the, I would say that it would be impossible to replace Ajit. And, and we wouldn't try, and therefore we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't give the latitude in terms of size of risk or that sort of thing uh, that we give to Ajit. No, we've got, a, we've got a unique talent, in my view, there, and I think in Charlie's. And, and so when you get somebody like that, uh, you give enormous authority to them after you firmly establish in your mind that that's who you're dealing with. But that doesn't mean that the authority goes with the position. The authority goes with the individual. And uh, uh, we would not, giving your pen away in insurance, as they say, is extraordinarily dangerous. And uh, we have in this town, we have Mutual of Omaha, which in the 1980s had been built up carefully over probably 75 years by that time and become the largest health and accident association in the world, I believe. And they got the idea that they should be writing property casualty reinsurance. So they, they gave a pen to somebody within the place and probably nobody even heard the guy's name, you know. And, uh, and in just signing a few contracts, they lost half their net worth uh, in a very short period of time. And they were worried that they might have lost more than that. So you can do enormous damage in the insurance business with a pen. And you better have to be very careful about who you give your pen to. And we've given our pen to Ajit in a way that we wouldn't give it to anybody else. Now, it just so happens that I enjoy hearing about the kind of things he does. So we talk daily, but we don't talk daily because he needs my approval on anything. We talk daily because I find it very interesting uh, when he says, how much should we charge to insure Mike Tyson's life? for a couple of years. I mean, that's the kind of thing I can get kind of interested in. I, I, I asked him whether there was an exclusion in case he got shot by a, 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 a woman that felt unhappy about her treatment or something, but, uh, and it makes a difference in the price. But I, I enjoy that sort of thing, but I, I'm not needed. And Ajit is needed, and we won't find a substitute for him. And, uh, you know, there's some things that just have to be faced that way. Charlie? Yeah. What that quotation indicates is sometimes stated differently. You say, if it won't stand a little mismanagement, it's not much of a business. Of course you prefer a business that will prosper pretty well, even if it's not managed very well. But that doesn't mean you don't like even better when you get such a business that's managed magnificently, and, uh, and and both factors are quite important. We're, we're not we're not looking for mismanagement. We, we like the capacity to stand it if we stumble into it, but we're not looking for it. Yeah, we will not do things that we think are 
we will not assign tasks to people that we think are beyond their capabilities. And it just so happens that Ajit has enormous capabilities, so we, he gets assigned some very unusual things. But you don't see that prevailing throughout, throughout our, our, our insurance operation, and, and our managers don't expect to operate that way. That's, that's a one-off situation with Ajit, and he's, he's in good health, and, uh, you know, we uh, send him all the cherry coke or fudge that he wants. <laughs> Okay, area six. I recommend this fudge, incidentally. It's terrific. I'm having a good time. <laughs> good morning. I'm Steve Fulton from Louisville, Kentucky. I gave up uh, box tickets to the Kentucky Derby this afternoon to uh, come out and ask you this question. Thank you for this opportunity. My question relates to how you view or what your view is of the market's valuation of Berkshire shares. Uh, you commonly comment that Berkshire has two primary components of value, uh, the investments that they own, the stocks, the bonds, and, and similar, and the earnings uh, from the non-insurance operating companies that you've got. And uh, when you compare 2007 to 2008, the, uh, the investments were down about 13%. And the earnings were down about 4%, but the uh, value that the market was placing on the shares was down about 31%. And I was curious as to your comments on that valuation. Yeah, well, I think you put your finger on something. Uh, we, do, we do think that the, uh, we think obviously the investments are worth what they're carried for, or we wouldn't own them. In fact, we think they're worth more money than they're carried for at any given time because we think on balance they're underpriced. So we have no problem with that number. <clears throat> we define our earning power. We leave out insurance underwriting profit or loss uh, on the theory that insurance is, if it breaks even, will give us float, uh, which we will invest. Uh, and on balance, I actually think that insurance probably will produce some underwriting profit. So I think we even understated a little bit on that in that respect. But we think the earning power of those businesses was not as good last year as normal. It won't be as good this year as normal. Uh, but we think those are pretty good businesses overall. A, a few of them have got problems, and uh, uh, but most of them. Uh, will do well, and I think a few of them will do sensationally. So I think it's perfectly reasonable to look at Berkshire as the sum of two parts, a, a lot of liquid marketable securities, or maybe not so liquid, but, but at least fairly priced or maybe even undervalued securities and, and a lot of earning power, which we are going to try and increase over time. And if you look at it that way, uh, you would come to the conclusion that Berkshire was cheaper in relation to its intrinsic value uh, at the end of 2008 than it was at the end of 2007. But you would also come to the conclusion that was true of most securities. In other words, the, the, whole, the whole level of securities. And every stock is affected by what every other stock sells for. I mean, uh, if the value of, of ABC stock goes down, XYZ, absent any other variables, but XYZ is worth less. If you can buy stocks at eight times earnings, good companies, you know, or nine times earnings, uh, you know, they, uh, it, it reduces the value of Berkshire as opposed to when stocks were selling well, at 18 or 20 times earnings. I'm pulling those numbers out of the air. But the, uh, everything is affected by everything else in the financial world. When, uh, when you say a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, you're comparing it you got to compare that to every other, every other bush that's available. <clears throat> so <clears throat> you're correct that uh, Berkshire was cheaper in relation to intrinsic value at the end of 2008 than 2007, at least in my opinion, and that those two variables will count. We'll report them to you regularly, uh, and over time, we would hope that both increase and we particularly hope the operating earnings aspect increases because that's, that's our major focus. We would like to move money into good operating businesses over time and build that number a lot. Charlie? Well, I would argue that last year was a, a bad year for a float business. 
it was naturally going to make the owner of the float uh, appear briefly to be at a disadvantage. But long term, having a, a large float, which you're getting at a cost of less than zero, is going to be a big advantage. And I wouldn't get too excited about the fact that the stock goes down. I happen to know that there was one buyer there who rather inartistically bought about 10,000 shares when Berkshire was driven to its absolute peak. And how much significance does that have in the, in the big scheme of things over the long term? What matters are things like this. Our casualty insurance business is probably the best big casualty insurance business in the world. Our utility subsidiary, well, if there's a better one, I don't know it. And if I had to bet on one carbide cutting tool business in the world, I'd bet on ISCAR against any other comer. And I could go down the list a long way. I think those things are going to matter greatly over the long term. And if you think that it's easy to get in that kind of a position, the kind of position that Berkshire occupies, you are living in a different world from the one I inhabit. Yeah. Yeah, our insurance business now, it is a remarkable business, and it's got some remarkable managers. Uh, uh, there's one interesting thing that's happened. You, that, uh, in September, when we had a financial meltdown, and, and, and really almost the ultimate, it was almost the China syndrome type thing, uh, Americans started behaving differently. Probably people around the world, but I certainly know in terms of our businesses, it was like a bell one had been had been rung. Uh, and one manifestation of it was kind of interesting. Whereas it hurt very much our jewelry business, our carpet business, it hurt net jets, it hurt it hurt all the businesses, hurt American Express, for example, you know, the average ticket went down almost ten percent. I mean, it just was like that. That people's behavior changed. But one of the things it did was it also caused the phones to start ringing even more at, at GEICO. And, and we didn't change our advertising particularly. Our price advantage relative to other companies didn't change that much. But all of a sudden, just a, it, it was a remarkable, thousands and thousands and thousands of more people came to our website or phoned us uh, every week. So in the, it, all of a sudden saving $100 or $150 or whatever it might be, became important, not only the people that were watching our ads that day, but just the, with the people where it was lurking in the back of their minds, they, they went to Geico.com. So in the first four months of this year, last year, we added about 665,000 policyholders. That's a lot of people. Uh, it made us by far the fastest growing auto insurer among the big companies. First four months of this year, uh, we've added 505,000 in four months. I mean, it's, it's the behavioral changes. And that franchise, that competitive advantage has been built up over decades. And Tony Nicely has, has nurtured it like nobody else could, just day after day, office after office, associate after associate. But then it just pays off huge uh, when the time comes because we can't, we are the low cost producer. I'm a big auto insurance companies. That means we can offer the best value, and now people are value conscious. So these things are going on all the time uh, with our subsidiaries, with those managers, and it's, it builds a lot of value over time. I mean, every, every Geico policyholder is a real asset to the company. Uh, I could give you an estimate of value, but I don't think it would necessarily be smart. But they're worth real money, and uh, we are now the third largest auto insurer in the country, I think we'll end up the year maybe at eight and a half percent of the market. And it was two and a small fraction percent back in 1993 when Tony took over charge, took charge of the business. And the, re, the, the, the fundamentals are in place to take us much higher. Carol? 
Can you reach that peanut brittle? I yeah, promised right. you that this question did not come from Susan Lucci. <laughs> However, uh, it does concern dividend policy. It came from Peter Sar Sargent of Yardley, Pennsylvania. And to ask it, he quotes from principle number nine of the owner's manual. Um, and Warren wrote there, quote, we feel noble intentions should be checked periodically against results. We test the wisdom of retaining earnings by assessing whether retention over time delivers shareholders at least $1 of market value for each $1 retained. To date, this test has been met. Now, this was written some time ago. Uh, we, we will continue to apply it on a five-year rolling basis. As our net worth grows, it is more difficult to use retained earnings wisely. So I'm now quoting the questioner here. The recent annual report made me think about the performance of both the company and the stock price. Berkshire seems to have done quite well in the past few years, but the stock price seems to have not quite kept pace. So I looked at the last five years of earnings per share. Uh, they're on page 26 of the annual report, and they add up in total to $29,207. As you probably know, the closing price of Berkshire on December 31st, 2008 was 84250 if you add the 29207 per share of retained earnings to this, you come up with a, quote, minimum market value of 113457 Since Berkshire closed on 12-31-2008 at 96600 um, oh, wait, I, I, I've read something wrong here. The closing price of Berkshire on 12-31-2003 was 84250 and since Berkshire closed on 12-31-2008 at 96,600, and is, has been lower than that since, and is now around that now, it would seem that the market value has not increased for each one dollar retained. Assuming my analysis is correct, it raises the, raises the question of whether or not Berkshire will pay a dividend in the coming year or not. Well, we'll now have a short quiz on that program. <laughs> on the question, the. Uh... The earnings, incidentally, of the five-year period would include gains from things that were listed in unrealized appreciation at the end of the period. In other words, some of those were actually built into the asset value at the time, but then become realized. But the, the truth is, if you take all of the money we earned in the five years and the stocks, bonds, businesses purchased, and you sold them for cash on December 31st, 2008, uh, we would not have we would have had a loss on that. I mean, under the conditions that existed on December 31st, 2008. I think that's probably true of almost all capital programs that were followed. If you really measured it by what you could have sold the businesses we bought, we love those businesses, but but there was no market uh, to speak of for for many businesses at that time, and security values were down significantly. So I would say that he's absolutely right that measured on on the value on December 31st, 2008, that the reinvested earnings had not produced a dollar market value at that particular market point. Now, I would say this, that we also say we measure our business performance against the S&P, and we use book value as a conservative proxy for intrinsic business value. We think intrinsic business value is higher, but we use that as a proxy, and we've done that consistently throughout the history of Berkshire. And during that five-year period, or during any, we've never had a five-year period when we've underperformed uh, the S&P uh, in terms of the, what I would call the intrinsic value measure of Berkshire. And as I said a few years ago, it's, as we get larger, it's much harder to do that and we'll settle for a couple of points better. But so far that, that, that test has been made, been met. And it's been met while we've reinvested all earnings. So I think that we still have got the burden of, uh, the, we, we still should have to prove by the fact that Berkshire will sell above the earnings we retain. Berkshire sells above it. Every dollar that's been retained in Berkshire translates even today into more than a dollar of, of market value. But I would certainly say that if you took the five years and just sold all the things we bought during that period at that price, that there would be a loss. Charlie? 
Yeah, I, I don't get too excited about these oddball things that happen once every 50 years. If you're reasonably prepared for them and you're dented a little on the bottom tick and other people are suffering a lot more and unusual opportunities are coming to you that you don't see under other conditions, uh, I, I don't think we deserve any salt tears. Uh, take Wells Fargo. I think Wells Fargo is going to come out of this mess uh, way stronger. The fact that the stock at the bottom tick uh, scared a lot of people, uh, I think will prove to be a very temporary phenomenon. Yeah, Wells Fargo got down below, actually ticked below $9 a share <clears throat> at a time when spreads on business were never better, when deposit inflows were never better, when their advantage in relation to cost of funds versus other large banks had never been better. Um, but, you know, it, in a market that was terrified, it, uh, it literally, I had a class meeting that day, and uh, it was the only time any of those classes have ever got me to name a stock, but they actually pushed me. <laughs> and, uh, and somebody there with a block barriers or whatever those instruments are that they carry around these days, uh, checked the price and it was below $9. And I said that if I had to put all my net worth in one stock, that would have been the stock. Uh, the, their businesses, you know, the, the business model is fabulous. And then, you know, when would you get a chance to buy something like Wachovia, which had the fourth largest deposit base in the United States, and bring that in and then start getting the spread on on uh, assets versus liabilities that Wells gets and build the relationships they have. It's, it's a great business opportunity. Wells Fargo will be better off, unless they have to issue a lot of shares, which they shouldn't. Uh, Wells Fargo will be a lot better off a couple of years from now than if none of this had happened. Uh, uh, and I think that's true of uh, some other businesses as well. Uh, but, you know, you, uh, you have to be prepared. You can't let somebody else get you in a position where you have to sell out your position. Leverage is what causes people trouble in this world. So you don't, you don't, you never want to be in a position where somebody can pull the rug out from under you. And you also never want to be emotionally in a position where you pull the rug out from under yourself. I mean, you, uh, you don't want to, you don't want to have other people force you to sell and you don't want you to let your own fears or emotions cause you to sell at the wrong time. I mean, why anybody sells Wells Fargo at $9 a share when they owned it at 25 and the business is better off is one of the strange things about the way markets behave. But people do it and they get very, they get very affected by looking at prices. If they own a farm like I do, you know, 30 miles from here, they don't get a price on it every day. You know, they, I bought that farm 25 years ago and you look to the, you look to the production of corn, you look to the production of soybeans and prices and cost of fertilizer and a few things and you look to the asset itself to determine whether you made an intelligent investment. You have your expectations about what the asset will produce. But people in stocks tend to look at the price, so they let the price tell them how they should feel. Or uh, that's, that's kind of crazy in our view. We, 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 look, we think you should look at the business just like you'd look at the apartment house that you bought or the farm you bought. They let the fact that a quote is available every day turn into a liability rather than an asset. And all I would say there is you better go back and read Chapter 8 of The Intelligent Investor, where it tells you how to think about the market, and it will do you more good than learning what modern portfolio theory is all about. Okay, number seven. Uh, my, my name is Jim Powers. I'm from West Newton, Massachusetts. Uh, my question has to do with the stimulus bill uh, by the federal government. I've read that only 8% of the money is intended to go to infrastructure. Uh, when you invest money, you normally uh, look at the asset you're getting for the money. With the country going into so much debt, don't you think it would be better if a great percentage of the money invested by the federal government go to solid assets, as it did during the Great Depression with the Tennessee Valley Authority, Hoover Dam, other facilities that are still making money today and paying back the original investment by the government many times over while putting numerous people to work. Let uh, me answer that one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I
I would, I would certainly agree. I mean, the 30s, a lot of really wonderful things were done with the money that was used then to stimulate the economy, and, and uh, that should be the goal and the model. I can't evaluate perfectly what the current stimulus bill will do. I know that I, I did get a notice the other day uh, from the Social Security Administration telling me I'm getting $250 or more. And, uh, that ought to last me six or seven months. Uh, uh, Charlie will make his last longer, I'm sure. <laughs> But, uh, you know, that's, that's the stimulus that the Buffett household has received at the present time. Obviously, you want to use the money as intelligently as possible. Obviously, also, anytime the federal government does anything on a massive scale, uh, anytime, anytime, any big organization, a church, a business or anything, you know, throws all kinds of resources at something, usually it, there's a fair amount of slop. And uh, uh, I think that the intent but by the time it gets through Congress and everything, I can't guarantee the, how the result comes out. But I think the intent is to get the money into action quickly and to end up having it utilized in intelligent ways. But, but if the day after Pearl Harbor happened, you know, if you'd attached five or 6,000 earmarks to the declaration of war, you know, it would not have been a pretty sight. I mean, it, uh, we have a system now where that doesn't seem to be uh, perfectly effective, I would say, in, in detaching the interests of, of particular legislators uh, away from the common goal. I mean, it, 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 uh, uh, I get distressed when I look at what gets attached to some of these bills, and that certainly was the case in point. So I'll go along with Charlie on the answer, but I think the intent of the administration is the right thing. When the American public pulls back like they have, uh, government does need to step in. It will have consequences. We are doing things on a scale. We're doing the conventional things, but we're doing them in unconventional amounts, and we will see consequences uh, from what we are doing now. I, I think we should be doing it, but I don't think we should think it's a free ride. Yeah, we have one big no-brainer on the list of infrastructure investments that can be made, and that is a hugely improved nationwide electricity grid. The chances that that won't help us are zero, and that, when it happens, will enormously benefit Berkshire's utility subsidiary, but that isn't the reason I'm raising it. I would be making this argument if we didn't have a utility subsidiary. We might make it a little more strongly if we have the utility subsidiary, however. <laughs> Becky? This question comes from Rita Addison who says, how does Berkshire's strong balance sheet and credit rating help take advantage of buying opportunities when even weak financial companies can now borrow more cheaply than Berkshire by using U.S. government guarantees of their debt? Yeah, well, it, as I pointed out in the annual report, we are at a significant disadvantage in any financing type business where we are competing against people who are getting their funding and their financing uh, with a government guarantee. We, we, our raw material costs us a lot more money, uh, and that's particularly applicable at Clayton, where we have 10 or $11 billion of, of, uh, of really mortgage paper on, on, on uh, mostly manufactured homes, and uh, it's exceptionally good quality portfolio. Kevin Clayton and the people at Clayton Homes have done a great job in terms of lending responsibly. Our borrowers have behaved very well, but the raw material to fund that, that portfolio, money, costs us a whole lot more than some bank that's in trouble. And uh, uh, that's a real problem for us, and it, it's forcing us to try to come up with various other sources of funding that portfolio where one way or another we get people with government guarantees involved in the program. Uh, that's just a fact of life with us now. There are the blessed 
uh, who have government guarantees and, and they're the ones that aren't. And of course you see that dramatically in the case of some companies that have a government guarantee for part of their money and then sell other money, sell other bonds that aren't guaranteed. I mean, just the other day, uh, as I remember, I may be wrong on this, but I think Goldman Sachs sold something with a 400 basis point spread that wasn't guaranteed, whereas their guaranteed paper would be hundreds of basis points underneath that. General Electric sold something earlier this year uh, that wasn't guaranteed, and the spread between the guaranteed and the unguaranteed was huge. We don't have anything guaranteed to sell, so we uh, we uh, are not in that favored class in any way, and we can't become a bank holding company. Uh, so as long as the situation goes on, we have to figure out ways that we adjust. We only really use borrowed money. Uh, uh, we, we use it in our utility business, but other utilities are not in this favored class. I mean, the utility industry generally. So our, our utility bar borrows money quite well compared to most utilities. Mid-Americans uh, credit is regarded as very good. And generally speaking, we've raised our money at a, a lower rate, which benefits our customers uh, in the utility business. Uh, we don't use much money in the, in, in the rest of our businesses except for the financing at Clayton, and we won't use much money. So it, uh, we get our money by float, basically, and our float is, uh, it was $58 billion. Uh, I mentioned a little while ago that Wells Fargo raises its money in the first quarter at, I think, 1.12%, 112 basis points, which is very cheap. But our money's cheaper. Uh, we can't get as much of it as Wells does, but we do have $58 billion. In fact, we have more now. That... Um, you would think will cost us less than zero uh, over time, although there will be given periods when, when we have a cost to it. Uh, but we don't have an answer for going head to head against a government uh, sponsored uh, uh, business that gets, gets, can raise money with a government guarantee. We do not have a way of going head to head them, with them at any business, no matter how prudently we conduct our operations. Charlie? Well, of course we're at a funding disadvantage, but on the other hand, we aren't regulated like a bank or a bank holding company. Uh, I think we'd be pretty ungrateful if we took this one disadvantage that has come to us and obsessed on it. I get those kind of lectures all the time. <laughs> okay, number eight. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Buffett. Hi, Mr. Munger. My name is Mary Kimball from New York City. In getting back to basics, what do you think Ben Graham would have said about derivatives? He would not have liked them. Um, he probably, I think he probably would have said pretty much what I said back in 2002, that they pose a real risk to the system. They, they cause leverage to run wild. They cause people, counterparties to sign up for things that may be difficult to, to achieve under certain circumstances, uh, that they place an already fragile economic system, uh, added strains on them, which can pop up in unpredictable ways. But he would probably also say if he saw something that were mispriced, he'd, he would uh, act accordingly. But he wouldn't get himself in a position where the problems of the people who didn't act prudently could cause him any problems. And... Uh, I think that probably would be the answer. The, one of the, one basic problem about derivatives, well, there's several problems. I mean, back in, after 1929, Congress met, there was a PCORA committee and so on, and they decided that it was very dangerous to let people borrow a lot of money against securities and that it contributed to the, the Great Depression. And therefore, they said the Federal Reserve should regulate how much people uh, could borrow against securities and was important for society. And they, the Federal Reserve started requiring margin, they had margin requirements. Those requirements still exist. You are not supposed to be able to borrow more than 50% against your securities. Actually, during one period, they went to where they didn't, the Federal Reserve allowed no borrowing whatsoever. They went to 100% margin. 
But derivatives came along and just turned that into a, made those rules a, a laughing stock. You have what they call total return swaps, which means you can borrow 100% against what you own. That goes way beyond anything that existed in 1929. So derivatives became a way around regulation of leverage uh, in markets, which, like I say, Congress felt was important, and the Federal Reserve still has a responsibility for enforcing. Derivatives also meant that settlement dates got pushed out. One of the problems in securities markets comes about when you have a trade today. If you had, didn't have to settle it for a year, you'd find it very hard to sometimes to find a person on the other side. And der derivatives allow these very long settlement periods, whereas security markets demand them in three days. There's a reason they demand them in three days. As you extend out periods, you get more and more defaults. So they're a danger. They are a danger to the system. There's no question about that. We have a book in the bookworm called The Great Crash by Galbraith. It's one of the great books. Uh, you really ought to buy it. It tells the story of the 29, and it gets into margin requirements. So <clears throat> Ben Graham would not like a system that used <clears throat> derivatives heavily, but he would, I don't think he would have been above uh, if he saw something that looked way out of line and he knew he could handle it himself. I think he would have been quite willing to buy or, or sell one that was uh, mispriced. Charlie? I think there's been a deeper problem in the derivative business. The derivative dealer takes two advantages of the customer. One, there's a croupier-style mathematical advantage equivalent to the house advantage in Las Vegas. And two, the derivative dealer is playing in the same game with his own clients uh, with the advantage of being a better player. So, And having knowledge of what they're doing. Yeah. And having knowledge of what the clients are doing. This is basically a dirty business. And you're really selling things to your clients who trust you that are bad for the clients. We don't need more of this kind of thing in America. We need less. Andrew? Well, this question came in this morning, and it's a, a timely philosophical one, uh, given the results of the stress test will be coming out next week, and it uh, relates to your stakes in Wells, uh, U.S. Bancorp, and Goldman Sachs. Um, and the question is the following. The government's proposed restructuring plans for Chrysler and GM require creditors as well as common shareholders to bear losses. Yet with the banks, the government's actions to date have not required concessions from holders of preferred stock and debt. The government has merely required the dilution of common stockholders. To what extent should holders of preferred stock and debt share losses in the bank rescue plans or in the resolution of a major bank holding company, and do you expect to be diluted in any of your holdings? Yeah, I would say this, that, that, that that's very institution specific. Uh, with Freddie and Fannie, the preferred was gone. I mean, there, there was no equity, uh, and the preferred got, in effect, it's gotten wiped out along with the common stock. Uh, with U.S. Bancorp or Wells, those are companies making lots of money. Uh, there's lots of equity there, so there's no reason to go up to senior securities and say that they should give up anything when there's lots of common equity underneath. It'd be like if I have a mortgage on my house and uh, it's a se it's 70 percent against its current value, uh, saying just because other people are having trouble in the neighborhood uh, paying their mortgages because they got much higher mortgages or something, saying my mortgage holder was 70 percent mortgage that he should give up something and increase my equity even further. There's lots of equity there, which there is at Goldman, U.S. Bank, Wells Fargo, there's lots of equity, lots of earning power. Uh, there's really no reason for senior debt to give up anything. You know, you can make an argument at Freddie and Fannie about the subordinated debt, whether they should have suffered as well as the preferred stock and the, uh, the common, but I don't see it as applying to earning institutions with lots of future earning power. I would love to buy all of U.S. Bancorp, you know, or I'd love to buy all of Wells if we could do it. You know, we're not allowed to do it as a because it makes us a bank holding company. But those those businesses, there's no reason for the creditors to suffer. Now you get into Chrysler or something of that sort. You know, there is no. I mean, they're losing money all of the time, and they have 
they do not have a competitive advantage. You know, whether they've got a sustainable business model under any circumstances is, is open to question. Whether there's any common equity there is not open to question. You know, there isn't any common equity. Nobody would pay a dollar, you know, if they had to take on Chrysler and all its debts. Lots of people would pay billions of dollars to take on U.S. Bancorp or Goldman Sachs, you know, with, with all their debts. So those are different, those are different situations. I, if you get into a situation where the common equity is wiped out, then you get into a question of, then you get into the proper allocation of things within the capital structure, who gives up so much, and the senior debt may give up something, and so on. But I don't, I don't see it as applying at all to businesses that are worth a lot of money, where the equity is worth a lot of money. Charlie? I have nothing to add. <laughs> okay, number nine. Hello, Mr. Buffett. Yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger. My name's Kelly Cardwell from Warrenville, Illinois. Guys, if either of you were starting a smaller investment fund today, let's say in uh, Warrenville, Illinois, $26 million fund called Central Square Capital, hypothetically. Well, you'll, get bill <laughs> you'll get billed for a commercial later on. <laughs> <laughs> with, <laughs> with this smaller asset base, what would you do differently, both in terms of the number of positions and frequency of turnover? For example, if you owned a portfolio of 10 stocks and five of them doubled in a short time period, would it make sense to actively manage the portfolio and take profits in the five that had doubled and redeploy the proceeds into your positions into the ones that had not moved higher? where presumably more upside exists and the odds are more dramatically stacked in your favor? Or would you favor the strategy of sitting on your hands in the name of long-term investing? We would, we would own the half a dozen or so stocks we like best, and we wouldn't have anything to do with what our cost on them was. It would only have to do with our evaluation of their price versus value, and it doesn't make any difference what the cost is. And instantly, if they went down 50 percent, we would say the same thing. I, you know, and using your illustration, I don't know whether that fund has actually had something that went up or went down. So, <laughs> so we would, we would, uh, our cost basis, except in rare cases, and we actually have a situation like this at Berkshire now, which I may explain a little later. But the, the cost basis doesn't have anything to do with the, the fund. When Charlie and I ran funds, uh, we didn't, we didn't worry about whether something was up or down. Uh, we worried about what it was worth compared to what it was selling for, and we tried to have most of our money in relatively few, very few positions, which we thought we knew very well. We do the same thing now. We do the same thing 100 years from now. Charlie? Yes, he's tactfully suggesting that you adopt a different way of thinking. <laughs> no. Carol? <laughs> Um, this question is from My Michael uh, Welter of Portland, Oregon. You've often said that two things you look for in an investment are a sustainable competitive advantage and a simple, easy-to-grasp business model. Berkshire's sustainable competitive advantage is arguably you, Warren and Charlie, and that obviously is not sustainable over the long term. I reject that <laughs> defeatism. <laughs> I knew you would. Um, uh, while at this point, Berkshire does not have a simple, easy-to-grasp business model. So if the two of you were outside investors, is it possible that no matter what combination of intrinsic value and price Berkshire offered, you would not invest in it today? No, our sustainable competitive advantage is we have a culture and a business model which people are going to find very, very difficult to copy, even even uh, semi-copy. We we uh, we have an unusual group of shareholders. We have we have uh, a business that's owned by people, where the turnover on our stock, even allowing for all the double counting and everything like that, maybe something like 20% a year. When virtually every stock in the S&P 500 turns over 100% a year, so we have a different. We have a different shareholder base. We have people that understand their business differently. And we have a business that can offer to people who own private businesses the chance to 
keep running their businesses as they have in the past and get rid of the problems of lawyers and bankers and all kinds of things like that. Uh, and I don't see any other company in the United States that has the ability to do that now or probably the ability to adopt that model in, in, in any big way. So I would say we have sort of an, an ultimate, and it's not peculiar to me and Charlie, we may have helped create it, but it's, it is a deeply embedded culture which any CEOs that follow uh, are going to uh, uh, be well versed in when they come into the job and dedicated to and able to uh, continue in the future. And you can't do, I don't want to name names about other companies, but you can't, you can't do that elsewhere. So I think, I think anybody wanting to copy Berkshire is going to have a very hard time and I think the advantages we have are going to be very, very long-lasting, and they're not peculiar to the fact that Charlie and I are sitting up here anymore. They may have been originally, but no longer. Our culture, our managers join that culture. Our shareholders join that culture. It gets reinforced all the time. They see that it works. You know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's something that I wouldn't, I don't know how I would, how I would copy it if I were running, you know, the, some other company. And, uh, and it's meaningful because there will be businesses, uh, just as there was with this car a while back, just as uh, the management at Geico felt back in the mid-90s in terms of what they wanted to do. There will be people that want to join up with us, and uh, they really won't have a good second choice. There'll be plenty that don't, too, but that's okay. We just need to have the right ones, some of the right ones join us, and it can go on a long, long time. Charlie? Yes, I might state that a little differently. A lot of corporations in America are run stupidly from headquarters as they try and force the divisions to come up with profits for every quarter that are better than the profits in the same quarter in the previous year. And a lot of terrible decisions and terrible practices creep into those businesses. In the Berkshire model, that doesn't happen. So. Well, Warren and Charlie will soon be gone, not too soon in my case, but I'm a little worried about Warren. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, um, the uh, stupidity of, of management practice in the rest of the corporate world will likely remain ample enough to give this company some comparative advantage way into the future. Okay, we'll go to, it's very important isn't it, to watch what you eat as, as, as you, um, in terms of preserving longevity. So we're, we watch it for hours up here at a time. <laughs> Number 10. Hello, Mr. Buffett. Mr. Munger, my name is Osnor Midov. I'm from Fame Studio Organization, San Francisco. And my question is from one of financial blogs. How do you justify holding stocks forever when the fundamentals have permanently changed? Well, the answer is we don't, you know. And uh, if, we, if we lose confidence in the management, if we lose confidence in the durability of the competitive advantage, if we recognize we made a mistake when we went into it, uh, we sell plenty of time, so it's, it's not unheard of. On the other hand, if you really get a wonderful business uh, with outstanding management, uh, but mostly the wonderful business part of it, uh, when in doubt, keep holding. Uh, but it, it, it's, no, it's no inviolable rule. Now, among the businesses we own, not just securities we own, we have an attitude which we express in our economic principles that when we buy a business, it's for keeps. And we make only two exceptions, when they promise to start losing money indefinitely or if we have labor, major labor problems. But otherwise, we are not going to sell something just because we get offered more money for it, even than it's worth. And that's a peculiarity we have, and we want our partners to know about that. We do think it probably helps us in terms of buying businesses over time. It's also the way we want to run our business. But with stocks, bonds, we sell them but we're more reluctant to sell them than most people. I mean, if we, if we made the right decision going on, we like to ride that a very long time, and we, we've, owned many, we've owned some stocks for decades. Uh, but if, if the competitive advantage disappears, 
if we really lose faith in the management, uh, if we were wrong in the original analysis and that happens, uh, we sell. Or if, if we find something more attractive, normally we have plenty of money around, but in September of last year, late September, we had committed to put 6.6 .6 million billion in, in Wrigley. We, and then Goldman Sachs needed five billion, GE needed three billion. I sold a couple billion dollars worth of J and J just because I didn't like getting our cash level uh, down below a certain point under the circumstances that existed then. That was not a negative decision on J and J. It just it meant that I wanted a couple billion more around, and I saw an opportunity to do something that I probably wouldn't see too much later, whereas I could always buy J&J &J back at a later date. But that's an unusual situation. I'd like to go back to one point on the earlier question, too. I always, I frequently ask CEOs of companies uh, what they would do differently if they owned the whole place themselves. You know, when, I, when I'm talking to either companies where we have invested in some other companies, friends of mine run them. You know, what would you do? Is it 100% owned by you and your family? And they give me a list of things. There is no list at Berkshire. You know, we basically run this place the same way we'd run it if we, we owned 100% of it. And, and that, that is a difference that in terms of people joining in with us, they don't have to adjust their lives to a bunch of rules that are kind of self-imposed in terms of how people think about public companies in terms of earnings predictions and all of that sort of thing. And there are certain people that would prefer to be associated with an enterprise like that. And also, following through on this rule I just explained, know that they've made a one decision on where that business that they build up over decades and cherish and everything, they make one decision on where it's gonna go and they're not gonna get surprised later on. They're not gonna get some management consultant come in and say, you ought to have a pure player, Wall Street saying, so you ought to spin this off or sell it or anything like that. And they know we're not gonna leverage it up. So they know they're really going to get to do what they love the most, which is to continue to run their business, not bothered by uh, bankers or lawyers or public expectancies or anything of the sort. And that isn't, like I said earlier, that's a real advantage. Charlie? Yeah, in the show business, they say the show has legs if it's going to last a long time. I think Berkshire Hathaway's system has legs. Okay, with that, we'll go to Becky. <laughs> this is a question from Human to Madden in Seattle, Washington. He's got a two-part question, but he says, from time to time, you purchase shares of public companies. Presumably, you feel that those shares are a better investment than Berkshire shares at the time, since you never buy back Berkshire shares. If Berkshire shareholders can purchase shares in the same companies for the same price as you, why shouldn't they shell, sell their Berkshire shares and buy what you are buying? And secondly, he wants to know why, because he, like thousands of other shareholders, is unable to attend the annual meeting. How come Berkshire does not webcast the meeting? I am aware of the irony that I will not hear your answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, our meeting does get written up, at least it gets written up a lot with various blogs and everything else. It gets written up pretty well in its entirety by Outstanding Investor Digest. And, uh, and th there are others that, that prepare extensive reports, I mean, they, and they pop up on the Internet. So he will, in all likelihood, find out uh, the answer. We, we could webcast. I get asked the same question about webcasting the, the meetings I have with students. You know, why not do that? It's so much easier and everything. I, I think they're... There is some, something gained by personal contact. I certainly know that when I was studying and all of that, I, I gained a lot by personal contact, even though I'd read Ben Graham's books, just going and being with him. And, and I follow that practice in teaching, and I, I think that I like the turnout we get. I like our partners to show up and see the products we sell and all of that. that the, this is not something where we're gonna go and hide and hold our meeting, you know, and then, in, in, in some hamlet, you know, in western Nebraska or something to discourage attendance. We've got a, we've got a different attitude, and I think that, that that, I hope that comes across, and I think that if we webcast it, and, you know, it was something like turning on a television show, I don't think it would be, uh, it would be quite the same. In terms of the first part of the question about buying the securities we buy, plenty of people do that, and uh, 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 some of them, but they, they, incidentally, they're not buying it with free float that's available from insurance. So 
So if, if they have $58 billion that they can get interest-free, uh, they will be in the same position we are in buying those securities. But they are, on the other hand, they have some tax advantages we don't have. So uh, I don't quarrel with people to do that. Uh, uh, we have to publicize to some extent uh, what we own. Some things they wouldn't be able to buy because we make direct purchases. They wouldn't be able to buy into the businesses we own. But uh, they might very well do better uh, piggybacking us in some way, and, and they're certainly free to do it. Charlie? Yeah, generally, I think it's quite smart to do what you're talking about, is to identify some investors you regard as very skilled and and carefully examine everything they're buying and copy what you please. I think you have a very good idea. Yeah, I used, when I was 21 years old, I, would, I, would, I had to mail away to the SEC in those days, and you got these crummy copies of about a week later and paid a lot per page to get them, but I used to get the uh, semi-annual reports of Graham Newman Corp before I went to work there, and I would look at every security that was listed there, and. Uh, and I got, I got some of my ideas that way, so it's, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Number 11. My name, <coughs> my name is Sam Alter. I'm 11 years old, and I'm from West Virginia, New Jersey. My question is, how will inflation affect my generation, and how is Berkshire investing to prepare for this time? Well, that was about inflation. How inflation was going to affect you? Yeah, how, how yeah. is inflation? Yeah, well, the inflation is going to inflation is going to affect you. The uh, you know the uh, it's certain we will have inflation over time. Paul Volcker got very upset the other day and spoke out about three weeks ago, I guess, when he read that a majority of the Federal Open Market Committee had sort of targeted two percent inflation as the number, and Volcker who came in when inflation was raging and saw the problems of stopping it when it got on momentum of its own, said, you know, 2% sounds great, but, but in a generation that cuts away purchasing power by 50%, he was got kind of a long generation there, but, but uh, uh, he was right in that once you start thinking about a couple percent, you are on something of a slippery slope. And we are following policies in this country now to stimulate things which stimulate business, which are bound to have some inflationary consequences. And to the extent that we borrow money from the rest of the world, it would be very human on the part of, of politicians in the future to decide that they would rather pay the rest of the world back in dollars that are worth far less than the dollars they borrowed. I mean, it's the it's the classic way of reducing the, the impact and cost of external debt, and we're building up a lot of external debt. Uh, I always find it interesting when politicians now talk about using the taxpayers' money to do this and the taxpayers' money to do that and how the taxpayers are paying the bonuses at AIG. We haven't raised taxes at all in this country. You know, I mean, taxpayers are paying nothing beyond what they were paying a couple years ago. As a matter of fact, the federal revenues this year, which were close to 2.6 trillion a couple years ago, you know, maybe more like 2.3 trillion. So we are taking less money from the taxpayers. The people who are really paying for the things we're doing now will probably be the people who are buying fixed dollar investments, much of it from the US government, and who will find the purchasing power when they go to redeem those investments to be far less. So you, can, you might say that, that the AIG bonus is probably the Chinese have, are, are the people that are ultimately paying the most in terms of the loss of purchasing power they will have with their, with their holdings of government bonds, U.S. government bonds many years down the road. But it sounds better to say the taxpayer than to say the Chinese are paying for it. Uh, it's an interesting situation. I, I, I read that comment every day about how the taxpayers are doing this and that. And, and I haven't had my taxes raised. You haven't had your taxes raised. They're giving me 250 bucks back here pretty soon. Uh, it, the taxpayers haven't paid anything so far. And my guess is that the ultimate price of much of this will be paid by a shrinkage in the value of the real value of fixed dollar investments down the road. Uh, 
And that will be the easiest thing to do. And if it's the easiest thing to do, it's the most likely thing to have happen. So you will see plenty of inflation. Now, the best protection against inflation is your own earning power. If you're the best teacher, if you're the best surgeon, if you're the best lawyer, you know, whatever it may be, you will command a given part of other people's production of goods and services, no matter what the currency is, whether it's seashells or rice marks or, or dollars. So your earn, own earning power is the best by far. If you're the best journalist, whatever it may be, you will get your share of the national economic pie, regardless of the value of whatever the currency may be as measured against some earlier standard. The second best protection is a wonderful business. You know, if you, if you own the Coca-Cola <laughs> trademark company, you will get a given portion of people's labor 20 years from now and 50 years from now for your product, and it doesn't make any difference what's happened to the price level generally, uh, because people will give up three minutes of labor, five, whatever it may be, to enjoy, you know, a uh, 12 ounces of a, you know, of, of a product they like. And so those are the, and those are the great assets. Your own earning power first, and then the earning power of a wonderful business that does not require heavy capital investment. If it requires heavy capital investment, you get killed in inflation. And uh, uh, with those guidelines, I would tell you the best thing to do is invest in yourself. Yes, the young man should become a brain surgeon and invest in Coca-Cola instead of government bonds. <laughs> I get paid by the word, he doesn't. <laughs> Andrew? Okay, this question comes to us from Dennis Wallace in uh, Waldorf, Maryland. Uh, we got a lot of these, and uh, I'm selfishly interested in the answer. Given the current economic conditions in the newspaper and publishing business, can you please provide some of your thoughts on its impact on Berkshire? Given that our investee, the Washington Post Company, has had a substantial decline in its stock value, is it still a good use of capital? And given the, quote, cheap trading prices of newspapers in the current climate, would Berkshire considering per consider purchasing additional newspapers to add to the Buffalo News and Washington Post properties? At what price does it become compelling to invest in the newspaper business, or is there no price at which it becomes compelling in today's environment? I would say in today's environment, I mean, it's, it's an evolutionary uh, development, but uh, so the current economic environment has accentuated the problems of newspapers, but it is not the basic cause. Uh, newspapers are to the American public as a whole. Charlie and I, I read five a day. Charlie probably reads five a day. We'll never give them up, but we'll also be the last guys reading a newspaper while having a landline phone, by, you know, by our side. And uh, so uh, you don't want to judge consumer preferences by what we do. The, the newspaper, but no, the, the, the answer is for most newspapers in the United States, uh, we would not buy them at any price. Uh, they, uh, they have the possibility, and in certain places they've already hit it, but they have the possibility of just going to unending losses. And they were absolutely essential to a very high percentage of the American public, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. They were the ultimate business. They, it was a business where only one person won, basically, in, in almost every town in the country. There were 1,700 papers in the United States, and about 50 of those 20 years ago existed in, in a city where there were multiple papers. So they were a, they were a product that had pricing power, that was essential to the customer, essential to the advertiser, and they've lost that essential nature. They, are, they were primary 30 years or 40 years ago. If you wanted to learn sports scores or stock prices or, or even news about, about international affairs, uh, and then that uh, nature, what Walter Annaber used to call essentiality, I don't know whether it's in the dictionary or not, but it started eroding, and then the erosion has accelerated dramatically, and they were only essential to the advertiser as long as they were essential to the, uh, to the reader. And, uh, you know, nobody liked buying ads in the paper. It was just that they worked. And that, has, that is changing. It's changing every day. And uh, uh, I do not see anything on the horizon that, uh, that uh, causes that erosion to end. We... You know, at the Buffalo News, Stan Lipsy would 
greet me 10 years ago, and he would say, Warren, you should, as, as, on an economic basis, you should sell this paper. And I said, I agree 100%, but we're not going to do it. And, you know, we could have sold the Buffalo News for many hundreds of millions of dollars some years back, and we couldn't sell it, for, you know, for remotely anything like that now. And that's one of the policies. We, the union has been very cooperative. Unions, a bunch of unions, have been quite cooperative with us in, in recent months in trying to have an economic model that will at least keep us making a little money. And uh, as I put in the annual report in our economic principles, that as long as we don't think we face unending losses or have major union problems, we will stick with the businesses, even though it would be a mistake if you were acting as a trustee for you know, a bunch of crippled children or something of the sort. And that's just our policy at Berkshire. Uh, the Post has a very good cable business. It has a very good education business. But it does not have answers on the newspaper business, as Don Graham wrote in the annual report, nor does anyone else. Now, we all keep looking around for somebody that will find a model. But there, I think there are about 1,400 daily papers now in the United States. And nobody yet has found the model. Uh, we are as well positioned in Buffalo, believe it or not, I think, to play out the game as anyone else. But whether we find something before the, the lines get so that we're inexorably in the red, uh, or whether the situation gets so we're inexorably in the red, I don't know, but we will play it out as long as we can. It's not what they teach you in business school, but it's, it's the way we run Berkshire. Charlie? Well, I, I think that's all 100% right, and it's really a national tragedy. I, uh, the, these monopoly daily newspapers have been a, an important sinew of our civilization. And by and large, they were impregnable from advertiser pressure, and by and large, they were desirable editorial influences, and by and large, they kept government more honest than it would otherwise be. So as they disappear, I think what replaces it will not be as desirable as what we're losing. But this is life. Number 12. Uh, good morning, Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger. Uh, I'm Mark Rabinov from Melbourne, Australia. I'm wondering if I could ask you our retailing, manufacturing, and service businesses have been severely impacted by the recession. Given the way consumer spending has changed, is it likely the results will still be 20% below 2007 levels in three years' time? I don't know about three years' time. Certainly, uh, those areas you named to varying degrees have been hit very hard. Some of the manufacturing uh, would tie in with residential construction. If we hold housing starts at 500,000 a year, uh, you know, my guess is that in a couple of years at most, we would get something close to equilibrium in housing, maybe, maybe quite a bit sooner. I, 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 nobody knows the figures with precision. But if you keep forming households at a million three or something like that a year and you create 500,000 new units and a few of the old ones burn down and a few things, you will, you will reach equilibrium at, at a point that's not ridiculously far in the future. And that will make a big difference in our carpet business and brick business and insulation business and paint business and so on. Um, retailing has been hit very hard. Uh, the higher the end of it, generally speaking, the harder it's been hit. Um, there's been a big change in consumer behavior, and I think it will last uh, quite a bit longer. I, th I think for years, government was telling people to save, and now that they're saving, they're unhappy about it. But I think, I, I, I think, that, I think the experience of the last couple of years I don't think we'll go away very fast. I think it could last quite a long time. So I would not think our retailing businesses would do great for a considerable period of time. And I would say that in 
retail real estate, uh, I would think that uh, that would be a tough field to be in for quite a period. I think, I think that the shopping centers will be seeing vacancies that will be hard to fill. I think that their retailers will be struggling in many cases. And of course, the supply of real estate doesn't go away. So it, uh, that could be the shopping center business, which was selling at you know, these premier cap rates of 5% or even less sometimes. I think that is going to look very silly uh, before all of this is done. In fact, it already is looking that way. Uh, so I wouldn't count. I wouldn't, the service businesses are generally the better businesses. They require less capital and, and uh, uh, they can be more specialized in what they, uh, in the markets they serve in general. But I would not look for any quick rebound in the retail manufacturing and service businesses. We've got a ways to go on that and we've got a ways to go on the ones that are construction related, but at least there you can sort of see the math of when it'll work out, and you can get a lot of information on what's going on in real estate markets. Uh, South Florida, I think, will be, for example, I think that's going to be a problem for a, a long, long time. I hope it isn't, but I just think the math of it is is pretty devastating in terms of the number of units you have and net pot, net net household formation down there. You've got a lot to wade through, Charlie. I've got nothing to add. Okay. Let's go to Carol. Um, I got lots of questions uh, sent in to me about uh, the, the possibility of Berkshire buying its own shares. And um, uh, here's what one said. Um, you recently described Berkshire's policy regarding share repurchase as self-defeating because before repurchase, you said you would write a, a, a letter to shareholders explaining why we are going to do it. You said the letter would, by necessity, tell investors that the stock price was at a substantial discount to intrinsic value, which would cause the stock price to rise. The letter would be, in essence, a buy recommendation, though as a matter of policy, you don't make those. In the past, you have emphatically endorsed share repurchase by other companies and criticized managers who would not buy when the price was right. You have said no alternative action can benefit shareholders as surely as repurchases. Your previous view suggests little patience for a manager with a self-defeating policy. You have said when you have a manager who consistently turns his back on repurchases, when these are clearly in the interests of owners, he reveals more than he knows of his motivations. So, it, and the market correctly discounts assets lodged with him. Would it not be rational to conclude that the market will, inappropriately, will appropriately discount Berkshire's share price unless and until you abandon your self-defeating policy and engage in repurchases of shares? Yeah, incidentally, the, and this is important actually, the, uh, the comments I made about repurchasing overwhelmingly, those go back a lot of years when, when stocks generally were or frequently were cheap in relation to intrinsic value. I did not make that. You haven't seen me writing about that in the last 10 years or so because uh, I would say most of the repurchasing done in recent years I've thought has been foolish because people have been paying too much. And companies got, in many cases, they would never acknowledge this, but they were buying because they basically liked... Uh, they were trying to give out buy recommendations when buy, recommend, uh, buy recommendation when it wasn't justified. In the 70s and early 80s, Charlie and I would frequently urge people to repurchase shares because it was so, so much more attractive than other things they could do with their money. The only time we felt strongly that Berkshire should repurchase its shares was in, in uh, roughly 2000, whenever it was, that, that uh, we thought it was demonstrably below intrinsic business business value and then we wrote we would do it and it did become self-defeating. There's clearly a point where if we thought it was it was demonstrably below conservatively estimated in, intrinsic business value and we notified the stockholders we were going to do it, we would do it. I think it again would largely be self-defeating. Uh, I don't think that situation uh, exists now. I think I won't give any buy or sell recommendations, but I think it ought to be quite compelling. Uh, 
like I say, I don't, I think probably 90% of the repurchase activity I've seen in the last five years, I did not think was serving the cause of the shareholder. I thought it was being done because management thought it was the thing to do and their investor relations department told them the thing it, was, it was the thing to do and they were actually buying stock at kind of silly prices. That was not the case when Charlie and I looked at Teledyne or the Washington Post or Cap Cities Broadcasting doing it many years ago, but I haven't seen situations like that uh, in recent years. Charlie? I've got nothing to add to that either. Hmm. Number, it, it's interesting how many companies were buying in their stock at twice the present prices that aren't buying it now. I mean, there, there are lots of those. Uh, uh, we will never buy in our stock at a silly price. We may make a mistake by not buying it at a cheap price, but we'll never make a mistake, I don't think, by buying it at a silly price. And we think a significant percentage of corporate America has done that in recent years, including a few stocks that we've owned ourselves. Number 13. Uh, Jack Benben from Haworth, New Jersey. First, I'd like to uh, thank you. This is, I've been to about a dozen meetings. This is probably the best one. So thank you very much for the new format, and thank you very much to the journalists who really helped out a lot. At past meetings, you and Mr. Munger have talked at great length about opportunity cost. Excuse me. The past um, year has presented you with many unusual opportunities. Can you discuss some of the more important opportunity cost decisions of the past year, and were those decisions at all affected by the macroeconomic picture. Thank you. Well, certainly opportunity cost has been uh, much more in the forefront of mind in the last 18 months. When things are moving very fast, when both prices are moving and in certain cases, intrinsic business value is moving at a pace that's far greater than we've seen for a long time, it means that in terms of calibrating A versus B versus C, it's, it's tougher, it's more interesting, it's more challenging, but it's, and it can be way more profitable too, uh, but it's a different task than when everything was moving at a more leisurely pace. And I described earlier, you know, we face that problem, uh, and it's a good problem to have. We face that problem in September and October because we want to always keep a lot of money around. We have all kinds of levels of extra levels of safety that we follow at Berkshire and we will never get so we're dependent on banks or other people's money or anything else. Uh, we're just not going to run the company that way. So we were seeing things happen. I mean, we got a call. We got lots of calls, but most of them we ignored. But the calls we got that we ignored helped us calibrate the, the calls that we paid attention to, too. And we, if we got a call from a Goldman Sachs, I think it was on a Wednesday maybe, uh, you know, that was a transaction that couldn't have been done the previous Wednesday and might not be done the next Wednesday. And we're talking real sums, $5 billion in that case. And we had certain commitments outstanding. We had a $3 billion commitment out on Dow Chemical. I think at that point, I could be wrong exactly on the day when we made it, we had a $5 billion commitment out on Constellation Energy. Uh, we had six and a half billion we were going to have to come up with in early October on the Wrigley Mars deal. So we were faced with opportunity cost type considerations. And as I said earlier, we actually sold something that under normal circumstances we wouldn't have thought about selling if it was 10 or 15 points higher in Johnson & Johnson, but we, we just didn't want to get uncomfortable. Uh, so you are faced in a chaotic market particularly where people need large sums. So you're not talking about buying $100 million worth of something that, you know, one day and $100 million the next day, but all of a sudden you're called on for billions uh, if you're going to play at all. Um, we face that opportunity cost calculation frequently during that period. I mean, when we decided to commit to buy Constellation Energy, we had to be a, w willing to come up with $5 billion seven or eight months down the line. You didn't know exactly when because it would be subject to Public Utility Commission approval. But if something chaotic happened in the market next week, we would get phone calls or we would see stocks selling or bonds selling at prices we liked. And if, 
if the relative values against what we held uh, were, were interesting, we might sell things. Now, it's harder to sell things in huge quantities than it is to buy things in huge quantities during a period like that. So you have to, you have to measure whether you can actually get the offsetting transaction done to move from one to another. We have a much, if we're going to move billions from may have been moving hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of dollars from one holding to another. We, we really can have big transactional costs unless we're careful. But that's the kind of calculation we go through. And we, we love the fact that we get the opportunity to make those calculations. Uh, it's, it's, a sign of, it's a sign of opportunity around. And uh, uh, you know, we'll, we haven't had the flurry of activity like we had last year for a long time. Uh, so it was the first time we really faced the question, you know, can we raise a couple billion dollars in a hurry to be sure that we've offset the, the cash needs of what we're committing to on the purchase side. On the Johnson & Johnson we sold, we actually made a deal where we got, had a floor price on what we would sell that for just because the markets were so chaotic that we wanted to be absolutely sure that we would not end up a couple billion dollars less than comfortable when we got all through. Our definition of comfortable is really comfortable. <laughs> we, we want to have billions and billions and billions around, and then we'll think about what we do with the surplus. Charlie? Again, I've got nothing to add. Becky? This is a question from someone named Yim in Columbus, Ohio. It's, that, uh, that narrows it down. Yeah, <laughs> very company specific. Um, it says Geico has been spending around 400 to 600 million dollars on media advertising a year in the last few years. What are the deciding factors into how much to spend, and how could one estimate the net return on such spending? Well, that's a question people have been asking themselves since the beginning of advertising, <laughs> and you know, uh, I'm not sure whether it was Marshall Field or. John Dorrance at Campbell Soup or something. You know, one of those fellows said that, you know, when I asked whether they didn't waste a lot of money on advertising, he said, yeah, we waste half of it, but we don't know which half. And that, that is the nature of advertising. Although we, we, we can measure it better with Geico than most companies. We will spend about $800 million on advertising. We spend far more, even though we're the third largest company, we've spent far more than State Farm or Allstate. And we will spend more and more and more. I mean, we will never stop. Uh, we were spending $20 million a year, a little over that, when we bought control of it in 1995. But we want everybody in the world to, well, everybody in the United States, we're not going to uh, be selling insurance in China or someplace very soon. But we want everybody in the United States to have in their mind the fact that they can, there's a good chance they can save money by picking up the phone or going to Geico.com and checking it out, and important money. And when we get that message in people's minds, you never know what it's going to pay off later down the line because, as I mentioned earlier, starting in around September 30th, we saw a big difference in the propensity of people to come to us to save $100 or $200, whereas they might not have cared about saving that before. So we want, here's auto insurance, everybody has to buy it. Nobody likes to buy it, but they like to drive. And if you like to drive, you need auto insurance. Uh, and so it's going to sell. And you're going to buy it from somebody. And if you care about saving money, you're going to check with us. And we want to make sure everybody understands that. And we won't, you know, we will spend more money, I will guarantee you, three years from now. Now, we're getting more for our money in buying advertising this year. So $800 million this year buys more than $800 million that would have bought a couple of years ago. So we're getting more exposure for the money. But we love spending money on advertising at Geico, and we want, to, we want to be in everybody's mind. Coca-Cola is in everybody's mind around the world. You know, they started in 1886, and they just kept associating Coca-Cola with moments of pleasure and happiness, and billions and billions of billions of people have that in their mind. And they don't have anything in their mind about RC Cola, you know, or any, they just, you know, you, you say RC Cola to somebody, uh, around the globe and they give you a blank stare. You say Coca-Cola and it means something. And a brand is a promise. We're getting, our, we're getting that promise in people's minds that there's a good chance they can save money if they check with Geico and we'll never stop. Charlie? Yeah, it's interesting. 
if Geico would remain more or less the same size if we didn't advertise so healthy, and if the new subscribers are worth more than the $800 million we're spending advertising, then in an important sense, Geico is earning $800 million more pre-tax in a way that doesn't even show thing we like to see within Berkshire Hathaway. At the value, the value of Geico goes up by far more than the earnings every year. Uh, if if we keep adding these people, as Charlie says, and, and we could, we could maintain. I'm sure we could maintain for a very long time our present policyholder account and probably spend a hundred million dollars a year, maybe less. But uh, the, we are getting more than our money's worth for the. Uh, for what we spend. We probably waste some of it, but, but uh, overall, we're getting a terrific return on it. And if I thought we could get anything like the same return by spending $2 billion next year, we'd spend $2 billion. I mean, it, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's a very attractive business, and I don't see how you create anything like it. I mean, we are the low-cost producer. And if you're the low-cost producer and something people have to buy, and is roughly a $1,500 item. I mean, you've got a terrific, terrific business, and we have durable competitive advantage there. Okay, we'll go to number one, and I think then we'll break for lunch. Number one. Okay. Hello, Warren, Charlie, uh, Felton Jenkins from Savannah, Georgia, longtime shareholder and partner. Uh, just want to make a quick comment about something that was a big deal the last couple of years uh, about Pacific Corp. There was some controversy, but uh, I'm glad that Pacific Corp has agreed to work with the Native Americans and fishing communities on the West Coast to uh, remove the uneconomic and harmful dams on the Klamath River. So I want to encourage Pacific Corp management to uh, move quickly, close the deal, and, and open the river soon. But thanks for their improved efforts over the last year. Uh, my question is, yeah, you mentioned Wells Fargo got to nine dollars, and that was a, a great deal it looks like at that price. But, but what about Washington Mutual, AIG, Wachovia, Citigroup, Fannie Mae, even some Irish banks that I think you were involved with? Those went through $9, and probably a lot of people thought they were gr still good deals or mispriced at $9, and now you've got very expensive uh, toilet paper, essentially, out of those stock certificates. So, I mean, how would you know on the way down? And, and looking at something like Bank of America that was on the 13F sometime recently, what's the likely outcome for Bank of America, and how would you analyze what might happen? Thanks. Well, there's something you can't analyze. And I, on, the, on the Irish banks, I, I couldn't have been more wrong. Uh, but it isn't a matter of whether they go through $9 or anything like that. It's, it's really whether they, what, what their business model is. And, and, what kind of a competitive advantage they have. I would say that Wells, among the large banks, has by far the best competitive position you know, of any of the really large banks in the country. And they essentially, if you look at the four largest, they each have somewhat different models, but the model of Wells is more different from the other three than any one of the other three would be from the, the, uh, from the remaining group. Uh, uh, but I was wrong on the Irish banks in a very big way, I simply didn't understand, and I should have understood, and it was available for me to understand, uh, the incredible exposure they'd gotten to, to uh, 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 more land development type loans, not property loans in terms of completed properties, but, but all kinds of, uh, of land development loans. It was extraordinary, for, for a country with four and a fraction million people, you know, they had a, they had m money f lent for developing uh, properties, uh, homes that would extend just for forever in the future. It was a terrible mistake by me. Uh, nobody lied to me. Nobody gave me any bad information. I just plain wasn't paying attention. The, if you talk about the WAMUs, uh, well, I don't want to go through all the names on them but, uh, because it gets specific to some companies. Uh, but. There were a lot of signs uh, that they were doing things that 
a highly leveraged institution shouldn't be doing. And that could cause trouble if this model of ever rising housing prices turned out to be a false model. Uh, you can get in a lot of trouble with leverage. I mean, it, it's, uh, it, you start creating $20 of assets or something like that uh, for every dollar of equity. You uh, some of those big institutions uh, did some very, what in retrospect for certainly or were foolish things, uh, which if they hadn't been so highly leveraged would not have hit them as badly. Uh, and I would say most of them, if you, if you read the 10Ks and 10Qs and did some checking, you could, you could spot differences in them. Certainly you can spot, there's no comparison if you take Wells Fargo versus Awamu or something like that. I mean, you, you don't have to have an advanced level of sophistication about banking to compare those two. They're, they're two different kinds of businesses. It's like comparing a copper producer whose costs are $2.50 a pound with a copper producer whose costs are a dollar a pound. Those are two different kinds of businesses. One is going to go broke at a buck fifty a pound, and the other one's going to still be doing fine. And banking has real differences in it, but people don't... They don't seem to look at them. The, the figures are available, but and and uh, but the, they don't look, seem to look at them uh, very carefully. Uh, when Wells reported the other day, they have an item of expense of over six hundred million dollars in a quarter for the amortization of core deposits. That is not a real expense. I mean, the core deposit figure will be up over time, and they are entitled under the tax law to put up, I don't know, fifteen billion or so. And they get to amortize that, which is an, an advantage. But I didn't see one newspaper article or any commentator that mentioned that that $600 million charge is in there, which is entirely different than looking at any other bank. Uh, but it's just, it goes unnoticed. So the figures are there, and the information's there. And I think with, with Freddie and Fannie, for example, I think it was pretty clear what was going to happen. Now, the, Interesting thing is the government was telling them to go out and raise some more money for investors. Uh, and if those investors had put the money in, it would have been gone. It was already gone, actually, uh, within a month or two. So it, it, uh, uh, we had calls on that, people trying to, uh, investment bankers trying to place billions of dollars with us on something, on, on, on those two institutions. And you just could take one look at them and you could tell they were in big, big uh, trouble. Uh, you do have to know a little bit about, you have to know something about banking and what's going on in, 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 in the various kinds of lending and everything. And I would say that generally speaking, for people that don't spend a lot of time on their investments, uh, they're going to have trouble separating uh, financial institutions. I, I think it's much easier to come to a conclusion on something like Coca-Cola or Procter & Gamble than it is for a person who is spending only a limited amount of time on investing to make a decision on whether to own bank A or bank B or bank C. Charlie? Yeah, there's another problem. Generally accepted accounting principles allow a conservative, sensible bank to show vastly increased earnings if it changes its practices to make a lot of extremely dumb loans in large volumes. Generally accepted accounting principles should not be constructed to allow this result. It's, that's what seduces so many of these bankers into this ghastly decision making. Yeah, when we bought Gen Re, they had a financial products division. It was, it was named similarly to the AIG when it was called Gen Re Financial Products, AIG Financial Products. And it produced numbers regularly that were, they were, they were always satisfactory numbers, but but you know when we when we looked at that, you know it looked like all kinds of trouble to us. It cost us over four hundred million to get out of, and a black box like that can produce. You know that's why managements love them to some degree. They can produce numbers. They don't necessarily produce cash, and they sure as hell can produce all kinds of problems if you have to start posting collateral and doing things of that sort. Uh, and I would say it is tough for you might say the, the passive investor, the one who's not spending very much time on it, I would say it's difficult for them to discern when that's going on. So I, it's not a bad area to, 
to just say this one's too tough and go on to something else that's a lot easier. I think you can analyze a utility operation easier, you know, or some premier consumer company or something of the sort. I don't think I would look for the tough situations uh, uh, to differentiate tough industries in which to differentiate things. But there are huge differentiations. And again, I urge you to read the J.P. Morgan Chase Diamond's letter because uh, uh, you'll learn a lot by reading that. But a lot of the new regulation that is coming uh, wouldn't have even been needed if accounting had done a better job, particularly in banking. Uh, and yet I have yet to meet an accountant from any of the big firms who has said I'm ashamed of my own profession. Uh, that's a mistake in accounting. If they don't have shame, they're not thinking right. Well, with that happy thought, we will, uh, <laughs> we will go to lunch now. We'll reconvene about, let's reconvene about uh, a quarter of one. We'll start at that time with Andrew and move on to section two when we come back. And uh, I hope to see you all then. And then we'll go till three o'clock and 3.15 we'll have the annual meeting. Thank you and we'll be back at a quarter of. <laughs>